It was a historic event. When in the history of the United States has the certification of the electoral vote, the peaceful transfer of power from one president to the next, been delayed by violent protesters? I'm happy to concede that this is the first okay. time that people went on January Then it's historical. 6th. For the whiskey insurrection, was that not a rebellion or insurrection then in your eyes? Nobody was charged after the Civil War with insurrection as a crime. It doesn't mean we don't think that they weren't insurrectionists. How many how people many, is not a real, that's not how, a real contention. How, how many people did they kill on January 6th? It doesn't 6th? matter. Wait, For the start of the well, Civil War in the United States, how many people died in Fort it. Sumter? Both of us agree that you don't need people to die for it to be an insurrection, right? So why Wait, do you I'm keep bringing point, that up? A, it's a fantastic delusion. If you were to take Glenn or anybody else that has their partisan takes on this, put them in a room with artists and animators, and then have them describe what J6 was, then the animators would draw 500 Greenpeace activists picketing outside the Capitol building with signs saying, we don't like that you guys are trying to steal the election. That's what it sounds like. And then maybe a few of them got led in by the Capitol Police to walk around. Thankfully, however, thank God, we're in an era where we all have videos, we all have the internet, we can see the tens of thousands of people outside screaming, we can watch the brawling with the screaming, Metropolitan screaming. Police, that that's not all they did, Glenn, we can watch them brawling with the Metropolitan Police, we can watch them breaking into the Capitol from like 500 different angles, we can watch Ashley Babbitt getting shot as she's trying to crawl through a window where lawmakers are in direct opposition to federal police shooting her, we can watch every single one of these events on fold in real time and it doesn't look like anything that's being described by Glenn. Instead, the only response is Glenn says we saw the real videos because Tucker Carlson published 0.3% of the footage that McCarthy granted him that doesn't change any of the underlying facts of what we've seen. There weren't thousands of people inside the Capitol. You yourself put the maximum number at 2,000. What does thousand S mean? When you don't like how an election goes and violence. you show up to have a riot to try to make it so it doesn't happen, that's an insurrection. Yes. There were a tiny number of people. It doesn't matter the number. Why, when you pivot to irrelevant facts like this, there were a tiny number of people. That doesn't matter. It might have been 100. It might have been 2,000. Yeah, 500 people was enough between between to call it the Whiskey Rebellion. Even though those 500 men had no chance of taking over the federal government. That was called a whole rebellion, which is more serious than an insurrection. When Trump was talking to Pence and Trump said, you're too honest, Mike, after asking for like the 50th time to decide the election on his own, what did Trump mean when he said that? And Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. Because you're sworn to uphold our Constitution. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. We already voted, and what have they done? They stole it. We want our President Trump is here at the Capitol building with us. We saw the motorcade. Shit is about to get real. Hey, guys, coming right now. He's coming on the other side of the Capitol. Stand up, Alex, this is your revolution, buddy. I am very concerned about Mike Pence. I have no idea what he's going to do. Did not love the way the president talked about that. And uh, I don't know. We'll see. Anyways, we're walking over to the Capitol right now. And I don't know, maybe we'll break down the doors. Wow. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Firing squad.
God and found guilty of treason because men like him are the reason this country is falling apart. Where is Pence? Where is Pence? No, he'll be happy. What do you mean? We're fighting for Trump. I cannot see you. I can hear you. I think I'm about to be able to see you in just a second. Do you know, I tried to do research on this debate by looking at your last debate. It was absolutely chaos. I got through the first 15 minutes. I thought better be re better do research elsewhere. Yeah, I'm probably not going <laughs> to help. I'm sorry you had to subject yourself to that. <laughs> We'll miss Alex, but I think there's maybe a benefit to not having him here as well. I'm just about started. I'm just about ready in two seconds. We're just getting our stuff together. Dustin, are you live streaming this as well on your channel? Yep. Good. Uh, no, my procedure was documenters. Ah, uh -huh. no, Eu preciso saber os papéis. Não preciso isso cortado, tá? Oh, oh, Papel. Ah, tá bom. By the way, just to... Eu, just... Na realidade, eu prefiro não ter isso. Eu prefiro isso com, com papel. Podemos começar e vocês podem me fazer de novo. Ah. By the way, just so we know beforehand, uh, Destiny, so Glenn's team mentioned that they want to do, it with, did, uh, do this debate within an hour and a half. I said, like, we should shoot for an hour and a half, but I can do two hours. Of, okay, you know, brilliant. We can do two hours. Mm -hmm. But it's not a hard out. I was just sort of suggesting uh, that we have, like, a time in mind. But yeah. if it's going well and you guys want to keep going, I can, you know, I can do two hours and we can sort of revisit it in two hours. Okay. Victor, I'm precisando to use documentos, é quase impossível usar aqui, mas deveríamos começar e pode me dar depois. Okay. Are we ready? Gonna, as soon as I give them a thumbs up, I'm going to play RVM for 10 seconds, so just tell them, I'm going to do, and then in 10 seconds we'll be okay. Okay, so we're just going to do like a, just in a second, we're going to do about like a 10 or 15 second startup for our stream, so I don't know, it's not to start and rumble, and then whenever that's done, we're ready to begin on our end. Sure. So what do we need? Just like just do we? Than like, uh, we're gonna play our vignette and then we'll go in. As how how long? It's a ten second vignette. So, so let's go. Are you guys? You're totally ready because we're just gonna play our ten second vignette and be ready to go. Yeah, you go. Sure. Okay. Obrigado. Okay. Five seconds and we're ready. All right. Uh, today I'm hosting a debate. Ready?
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Today I'm hosting a debate between author and journalist Glenn Greenwald versus live streamer and political commentator Destiny. We're going to be debating about whether January 6th was an insurrection and Trump's role in it. So let's get started and lay some ground, uh, some ground for the rest of the debate. Was what happened on January 6th an insurrection? And can, within your answer, can you define what an insurrection is? Glenn, can you start and then we'll go to Destiny. Yeah, I'm really glad that we started there because I do feel like we spent in that last debate a lot of time on the question of whether this was a coup or whether this was an insurrection. And I feel like these are more political terms of art than terms of science that have a concrete definition, which is one of the reasons why I think it's not only justifiable but actually necessary to look at how these terms have been applied historically and in other contexts, not as a way of distracting from January 6th, but precisely to see whether or not the attempt to apply those terms to January 6th is consistent with how these terms are generally used or whether it's just kind of a partisan attempt to create a narrative that serves the Democratic Party. So for me, I guess you kind of have to look at coup and insurrection a little bit differently. A coup is when some faction in society, either the faction that is already in power or the faction that is not in power but wants to be in power, mount some very credible and serious attempt, almost always using force or the threat of force, people who are a militia or the actual military, in order to seize power illegitimately outside of the legal structure using uh, violence or the threat of violence in order to do so. An insurrection just simply, I think, implies that there's a faction domestically that has launched a serious rebellion, a serious attempt to seize power in that country, again, using extrajudicial, extra legal means that in almost all cases involves either the use of force or the threat of force. You may be able to imagine a situation where the use of force or the threat of force uh, is not necessary for an insurrection, but I think it's extremely difficult to imagine such a case. But in general, that's how the terms are used. And then you have these kind of subsidiary terms that are very new that are kind of retreats from those terms like le legislative coup or soft coup that, as I said, is a way to kind of put it into the general category of coup and insurrection without actually calling it one. And that typically involves the illegitimate use of a legal process or some other means that's still extrajudicial, contrary to the law, without actually using force or the threat of force to achieve those ends. Well, what about faking votes? What about what? What about faking votes? Would that be counted? I'm as sorry. If you tried to fake votes, would that be counted as an insurrection or you took just force, really? Fake to fake votes? Yeah. I mean, if you were to try and steal an election using fraud, I don't really think that's the sort of thing that we have in the past described as either an insurrection or a coup. That's just more stealing an election. And that's why I think it's so important to distinguish between actually when force is actually involved or invoked or the threat of violence is invoked precisely because there are so many other ways to seize power illegitimately that falls short of being a coup or insurrection. That's actually a good example of one, which would be fabricating votes or throwing away valid votes or fabricating invalid votes as a means of winning an election illegitimately. Uh, Destiny, what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I'm happy to almost run with uh, Glenn's definition here because I think January 6th pretty squarely and easily falls within that. But I guess the two definitions I would offer up are uh, the Colorado Supreme Court, they concluded that an insurrection, as used in Section 3, is one, a public use of force or a threat of force, two, by a group of people, and three, in order to hinder or prevent the execution of the Constitution of the United States. Um, in Paulson and Baud's paper, they go over broader definitions, but they more or less say the same thing in more words. Um, I mean, we can read from them and they would say that insurrection is best understood as concerted forcible resistance to the authority of government to execute the laws in at least some significant respect. So I would say that like an insurrection is probably more than being upset at a police officer and saying like, no, I'm not going to you know, get a ticket and running away. Um, probably has to involve a group of people who are making a concerted effort to like resist the good faith execution of law from the federal government in this case. Uh, and I think January 6th with... Uh, Trump's plan to circumvent the electoral process with false electors, um, the actual day of events where Trump gives a huge speech. He sends a whole bunch of people down to the Capitol, uh, ostensibly to protest the certification of the vote, where the people at the Capitol engage in violence uh, in order to prevent Congress from certifying the vote. 
And then when the people at the Capitol engaged in violence, succeeded in preventing the certification of the vote for some number of hours, and then were finally cleared away, I would say that whatever we call an insurrection or whatever definition we use, all of the events here are bullseye like an insurrection. So can I ask a question to you? I don't want to usurp your role. I don't know how you want to conduct it, but if yeah, you don't you mind want. it, like to just ask kind of follow-up questions to that. Mm -hmm. The question I have for you then, Destiny, is, is there any requirement that it actually poses a credible or a serious threat to succeed in its aim? So for example, let's imagine that Donald Trump wins the election in November, as most polls predict that he will, at least as of now. And let's say that you have one or two people inside the US government who are kind of career civil servants who view Trump as such a great threat to all things decent in the United States, and they go to the Capitol, and they're armed with knives, and they stand outside and they say, we have knives, and we demand that Donald Trump be removed from the White House, and the Congress vote to impeach him immediately and reinstall Joe Biden because we think he's the legitimate president. Would that, in the history books, is something that you would then call a coup or an attempted coup or an insurrection? Um, I mean, you might call it one, but I think it would be so minor um, and it would be so silly that I don't know if we would necessarily refer to it as such. Uh, for instance, like we could we could concoct a conspiracy to murder thing where I make a plan that's so ridiculous with another person that we're going to go and buy, you know, I guess snow and we're going to pour it down somebody's roof until it all melts and the person drowns and dies. And I'm like, maybe it and we actually go and buy the stuff and we go to the house and take steps towards the crime. But it's such a silly crime. I don't know if you'd call it that. Um, I'm sure we could find cases like really far away on the peripheral on the edge, but with January 6th, I think we're, again, I think we're in a bullseye definition of whatever we would call insurrection or attempted coup or rebellion. So I think the reason why I ask that is, I mean, I think actually the extent of the threat, like the credibility or the gravity of the threat is absolutely critical to whether or not in any other instance we would be calling something like this a coup or an attempted coup, because if you look at January 6th, although you did have more than two people doing the sort of thing that I just described, and I asked a ridiculous example to try and understand whether you would at least concede that it requires some kind of significant or quantitatively impressive attempt to actually seize control from the legal means of, of power. What you had on, Cap, uh, on January 6th is a hodgepodge of people, which according to the federal government itself had only a minority, a small minority of people who actually used violence of any kind. There's only something like 10% or 8%, depending on how you counted the number of people charged who are even accused of having used violence at all. And it's a pretty broad definition for using violence, like anyone who got near any attempt to hit a police officer or to push a police officer aside got put in that violent category. So I'm at a very small, small number of people. And then on top of that, not a single person during this entire three hour riot actually pulled out an arm, let alone discharged an arm. The only arm that was discharged was one that was used against the people who were protesting. And then it basically got subdued in three hours, not with any kind of real force, pretty easily. I mean, it was pretty easily subdued in a very short period of time. And I don't think anybody would argue, and I'm interested in whether you would, that this ever got near a serious threat to remove or topple the most powerful and militarized government ever to exist on the planet? I mean, do you think it even got close to a serious threat to do that? Um, so just, just as a quick thing, going through all of these points, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that's used to talk about January 6th that I feel like doesn't want to engage with the facts of what happened. And most of these points are just not relevant. So hodgepodge of people, um, it was a collection of Donald Trump supporters that had been called there weeks or months in advance by Donald Trump. All of these people showed up to his ellipse speech. Uh, a lot of them did. All of them marched to the Capitol, all chanting the same things with the clear goal of protesting the certification of the vote. That's why they were saying things like 1776, which we all recognize was a rebellion against Great Britain. Um, like, it, like it wasn't a hodgepodge of people. It was a collection of people that were all there for an incredibly specific purpose. I think it would be unbelievable for me for, to ever accept the idea that it just randomly happened that those people happened to be gathered, that were all supporting the same candidate, that was saying that Congress shouldn't certify the vote, that was trying to get Pence not to certify the vote, that these people happened to go down to the Capitol, they happened to engage in violence, they happened to succeed in delaying the certification of the vote, 
all of this happened randomly from a hodgepodge of people that were subdued in three hours, whether they were subdued, whether they discharged an arm. Um, and to say that they weren't a serious threat is also crazy, given that there were times where these people were literally rooms away from other lawmakers. Um, I think it's more incredible to say that it never was a serious threat. Like you yourself say that only a small percentage engaged in violence. What if that percentage instead of 10% was 15%? What if instead of 15, it was 20 or 25%? Who's to say what could have possibly happened afterwards? Uh, other than the fact that thankfully, retrospectively, we can look and see that it didn't get to that. But I mean, this was some tens of thousands of people that were many engaged in violent protests that were breaking into the Capitol and managed Wait, to delay the certification. Were, how, how many people are you saying were at the Capitol on January 6th? Um, I don't know. I've seen everything from 100,000 plus to some people say it was 50 to 70,000. I don't know what the exact who number is. Who entered the was, Capitol? No, no, not who, who entered, who were there protesting outside. Oh, how many entered? How many entered? Um, was it, I, the numbers I saw were any from one to 2,000? Right, okay. Yeah. So imagine so, if 5,000 would have entered or 10,000, right? Who's to say that there couldn't have been a Yeah, so just yeah. On putting on this, Destiny's point, at Glenn, at what point would you call that an insurrection? Or what, at what point would you say, you said 6 7% were violent. Is there a certain percentage that it needs to hit? Or was, Well, I mean, you, Destiny himself acknowledged in the very first question I asked him that you, there's a quantitative component to this for sure, which is why nobody would seriously call two people with knives gathering outside the Capitol, even though they're proclaiming an insurrectionary intention or objective, nobody would say in history that that would be referred to as the United States having survived a coup or a coup attempt or an insurrection because it was just far too insignificant. And I don't think that there is a, like, as I said, I don't think it's a term of science, these terms like insurrection and coup. I think they're like a lot of the terms that we use in our political vernacular, like terrorism and hate speech or disinformation that really has no fixed meaning. It all kind of depends on who gets to apply the term and for what purpose. Is a group using violence a revolutionary group fighting against cor corruption? Are they trying to topple the government and therefore a terrorist? All these terms are very kind of shifting because they're points of propaganda. But what I think is that in order to make a serious case that this is a historic event, I mean, I think one of the Krasenstein brothers began by comparing it to Pearl Harbor and 9-11 and the Civil War kind of invoking those kinds of events. Democrats have done that as well. I don't hold destiny to that, but clearly there's a belief, I think, that this is like a major event in United States history. And for me, the reason it, it wasn't is because it never did get anywhere near the number that would be required to pose a significant threat to the power what of the United States government. And, What's and that I, number that I don't, I mean, I don't think you can set a quantitative number. You can ask whether, and I think the kind of people who are there is so important. And that, I mean, he, uh, Destiny dismissed the idea that it was a hodgepodge trying to say they were all homogenized. Even the US government admits they were wildly disparate people, both in terms of why they were there and what they intended. That's why a few of them got charged with sedition, and then others got charged with misdemeanors, and then some people got charged with felonies, even though they weren't accused of violence, because they had extraordinarily different intentions. This was not, for example, like, I think you can look at a event that kind of comes closer to what would be required to call it a coup, which was the rebellion by the Wagner Group uh, in Russia, where you're talking about an extremely well-trained militia, a well-armed militia of 25,000 soldiers that had the capability to shoot Russian military aircraft from the sky, and they did. They took down six helicopters and a, and, a, and a military jet. But even there, the Russian state, nowhere near as powerful as the U.S. state, distracted by the war in Afghanistan, crushed it in 12 hours. Like in the, court, in the context of Russian history, that is not even like a footnote in terms of like a real threat to the power of the Russian state. And yet that at least had real Numbers, 25,000 who are real soldiers. Most of the people who are at this Trump rally, remember the four who died on January 6th, two of them died of a heart attack. One died of a speed overdose. These are people who are not even fit, let alone well-trained soldiers, at least the majority of them. And so when you're Just talking about people who this, really did this, anything like that, you're talking about a very small number. Yeah, so I, th there's... I, Again, I, I find this is, I feel like it's going to be a theme here. The, the obfuscation and then the misdirection and everything, I just don't think any of this is relevant. Nobody thought that the Whiskey Rebellion or the Whiskey Insurrection was going to destroy the entire U.S. government, right? It's a few hundred farmers that were upset over 
you know, taxes and alcohol. But like, why do we think that the, the insurrection of the rebellion needs a, a significant chance to succeed in order to be called an insurrection or, or, or a rebellion? That's just historically, you keep saying historically, 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 that's never been the case. It's never been the case that we've had to establish that it would have never been the case, for instance, if only one state seceded uh, and they had no realistic chance of winning in the Civil War that we would say, oh, well, they weren't insurrections or rebellionists because they were never going to win. Um, so on that ground of like they have to have a realistic shot at winning that's i just don't think that that's just not grounds ever for an insurrection um or, or to declare some insurrection or rebellion it's just a way to minimize the events that actually happened because they happened to not be successful um when we talk about how because if, um, it, if it's what, a joke then it, if it's a joke it should be treated as such but it, but did, it, it as, was like, a joke world historic event it was a historic that event threatened the united states government it did threaten the u.s government it was a historic event what other time in u.s history has the certification of the vote been delayed the certification, we've had so many official proceedings of Congress, including things like confirming Supreme Court justices, delayed because people went to Capitol Hill, entered Capitol Hill, occupied Capitol Hill, and protested the proceedings mm -hmm. and ended up delaying the proceedings. There have been proceedings to vote on wars, yep. where anti-war protesters have disrupted. So all the time we've had people entering the Capitol, protesting congressional mm -hmm. proceedings, and never are the ones who don't use violence accused of felonies, let alone anything resembling the kinds of charges that the January 6th defendants faced because the ideology, the ideological component here is what made this to be something now, so much bigger so than super, in fact what it was. I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna ask the same question again. When in the history of the United <laughs> States has the certification of the electoral vote, the peaceful transfer of power from one president to the next been delayed by protesters or violent protesters? There, I, I'm happy to concede that this is the first okay. time that people went on January Then it's historical. 6th then it's historical. interrupted the proceeding. Yeah, then I it's mean, historical, it, right? By definition, no, no, it's a moment it's in history that is unique. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a serious disruption. There they delayed the vote, any, didn't they? By three hours or by four hours. For the first time in so U.S. Much. history, yes. That's significant. The, that's serious. Why, why is it more significant to delay this proceeding than other congressional proceedings? Things like voting on wars or confirming Supreme Court justices are pretty serious, too, in terms of the things Congress <laughs> is supposed to do under Article One. But the reason we don't consider those protests, even though they might have delayed the proceedings some, to be historic or serious or an insurrection, is because they never posed a threat to the stability of the United States government. In order to have an actual insurrection, of the kind that you want to claim this is, you would need enormous numbers of very well-trained people who are heavily armed with serious plans to go into the Capitol and overthrow the power of the United States government. This is the kind of drama queen behavior that has dominated Why, the so, Trump years where every every yeah. kind of event is catastrophized to its highest extent. So, so, you then, so you would say that any past, so like the Whiskey Rebellion in the United States, that was, that's stupid. They shouldn't have called it that. They should have called it like the farmer protest or something different. Or because I don't even what you're the, saying I mean, right now, it stands in contrast to how every other person viewed insurrectionism or insurrectionists at the time when, say, the 14th Amendment was drafted and ratified. People viewed people sometimes as being insurrectionary or uh, giving aid or comfort to enemies of the United States just for letting their children go off to war to serve the Confederacy. It's nice if you, Glenn Greenwald, personally have some view of what you personally think and insurrectionist or rebellion might look like or what it should be but to be quite frank your opinion doesn't really matter the opinion would be the historical relevance of the saying in the united states it would be the historical analysis that exists for for historical rebellions or insurrections in the united states which oftentimes had very little to no chance of succeeding even the insurrectionists themselves thought that they were going to succeed um and, and we would use that analysis that exists at the time when say the 14th amendment was ratified and then we would use that going forward to figure out what do we think an insurrection and a rebellion is and again you can try to minimize and you can try to call it ideological and whatever you want none of those congressional protests that you mentioned in the past rose to a level where tens of thousands of protesters were violently breaking into Congress and delaying the certification of the presidential is, you, vote. You just, got done, you just got done saying that the maximum number of people who entered the Capitol was 2,000. And now you're calling it tens of thousands of people because you know so well. In fact, you conceded in the very first question I asked you that of course there has to be a quantitative component in terms of the gravity of the threat in order to seriously call it an insurrection or a coup, which is why I began by asking you whether or not if two people armed with knives went to the Congress and demanded that Donald Trump be removed after he was declared the winner and threatened to use violence with their knives, whether that would in the history books or by our major newspapers be referred to as the United 
United States fighting off, fighting off a coup or an insurrection. And you said, yeah, I mean, I guess if it's just two people, then it would probably be pretty ridiculous to call it that. So I see this, what happened on January 6th, a three-hour riot that even the FBI's informants on the ground told the FBI in real time was never intended to be any kind of premeditated violent act on the part of most people, but instead was something that happened spontaneously, as so often happens, where political protests confront the police and become violent. I see it much more akin to the kind of ridiculous example that I began by asking you, where you conceded that wouldn't be called an insurrection, than I do some kind of civil war type situation or even a meaningful armed rebellion of the kind that happened in Russia last year where even that was crushed in 12 hours. Are you, are you, ever, like are you familiar with Loki's wager? <coughs> Explain it to so, me. So uh, I think Loki makes a wager with two dwarves or whatever, whatever <coughs> and eventually they say that they can cut his head off. Um, it comes to the point to where he loses the wager, he, they go to collect their bet, and when they're trying to figure out how to cut his head off, they're arguing over what part of the neck is when the head starts, and, and then the rest of the neck begins, basically. And the argument he eventually makes is, well, you can't take even a, a, a centimeter, an inch of my neck, therefore you're not allowed to cut my head off. You're trying to argue right now that because I might not consider two people an insurrection, that I can't possibly consider 2,000 people an insurrection, that's the same as you saying, since I can't tell precisely where your head ends and your neck begins, I might say that your toe is part of your head. This argument is nonsense. And the only way that you can make the argument is to continue to try to make comparisons to other more extreme coups or more intense insurrectionist attempts, which I agree. There can be more extreme insurrectionist attempts. There can be more extreme coups. But the reality is, so this, even this if you want to wind it all end. the way back down, even if you want it all the way back down, say, like, okay, we'll ignore the tens of thousands of protesters outside. We can just go with 2,000 people. How, Glenn, how are you seriously going to argue that 2,000 people inside the Capitol with the goal of delaying the certification of the vote, which they accomplished, doesn't represent an insurrection. Wait, so I'll before, explain wait, why. Wait, Glenn, eat, Glenn, just before oh, you go Glenn. on, I just, want to, that's it, I just want to put you on Glenn's question. So Glenn's uh, question was, he said an insurrection in the, when, when there's an actual threat to democracy, I'm pushing off uh, that a vote isn't a threat to democracy. At what point did you call it an insurrection? Would you call it an insurrection on January 6th? I I don't know, like, here's the thing. I don't know the thin line that they'd have to cross to call it an insurrection, but whatever line that is, it was crossed a long time ago. You had the president of the United States calling up over 100,000 people to DC, and then he riled them up saying that they needed to essentially delay the vote. He was relying on Pence to do it. All of those protesters went to the White House. Um, a lot of them, or not to the White House, sorry, to the Capitol building. A lot of them broke into the Capitol building with the goal of delaying the certification of the vote because they didn't like the outcome of the election and they wanted to change it. They needed to fight like hell to take their country back because Mike Pence wasn't gonna do the right thing by helping Trump do his constitutional coup. And so they turned it into an insurrection. It's, it's plainly what happened. Now, if only 20 people went in, would I consider it an insurrection? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. If only, you know, 100 people went in, maybe. Uh, maybe if 200 people went in and they got further, maybe. I'm not sure where exactly I would, you know, slice the pie to, to call it, you know, uh, whatever we call it. But wherever we're at, we're way, 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 way over that. And I just don't think the comparisons to other more extreme coups or more extreme rebellions or anything in Russia, it just doesn't make any sense. It's only done to equivocate on what's actually happened or to, to do a whataboutism to something that I would probably plainly, uh, plainly agree with like wouldn't you agree this was a more serious coup or more serious insurrection yeah sure there can be more serious coups and more serious insurrections much the same there could be more brutal murders of, of one person another it doesn't make one murder not a murder just because you did it easier or did it cleaner okay so first of all the reason as i said at the start why historical comparisons or historic comparisons to other incidents are so important is because there's a gigantic ideological and partisan motive here and exaggerating the extent to which what happened on January 6th was a serious threat. And especially when somebody is a Democratic Party partisan who goes around saying the Democratic Party is better, we want people to go and vote for Democrats, we want to make sure Donald Trump doesn't return to power, and at the same time the narrative they're pushing coincidentally aligns perfectly with their partisan agenda, then I think it's important to start questioning whether or not there's any authenticity of the beliefs based on how other situations have previously been treated. So let me just make two points here about what Donald Trump did. You're actually allowed to summon people to Washington to protest. It's one of the most important rights that the Constitution guarantees. The president is completely free to call his supporters to Washington and to tell them and argue for them that some injustice has been committed and that they ought to protest in response to it. There was one time and only one time 
when Donald Trump addressed the question of whether or not violence should be used when those people went to the Capitol. And what he said was this, quote, I know that everybody here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. And the fact that people, because he said peacefully, then have to resort to things like, oh, well, he invoked political cliches like fight like hell. Politicians use fight like hell in almost every speech. Joe Biden, you can read this in the New York Times on December 2nd, said, quote, I want to make sure we're going to be fighting like hell. You can find pretty much every politician saying that. So that's one thing, is that to the extent you want to say that Donald Trump was somehow a involved in this quote unquote insurrection. The only thing he did was give a constitutionally protected speech and that is the reason why Jack Smith has not charged him with inciting or participating in an insurrection. It's not my opinion, obviously Jack Smith shares the opinion that he could never obtain a conviction. The second thing is on the numbers, 2,000 people, let's use the maximum number, went into the Capitol. A small percentage, a tiny percentage of people who went into the Capitol actually used violence. So most of those people, the vast majority, according to the US government themselves, were doing nothing other than peacefully protesting. Again, protesters entering the Capitol without authorization, occupying offices of members of Congress in order to pressure them to take some step or not take some step, is something that happens all the time. We've seen many more than 2,000 protesters. So don't try and imply that on January 6, 2,000 armed people or well-trained people intending to commit violence went into the Capitol. The most of that number that you could possibly squeeze out of it is something like 100 or 150, and now we're back way closer to the most ridiculous example that I began by asking you about, where even you said, oh, that probably shouldn't be called an insurrection, than we are to an actual threat to American power or to our system of government, which is necessary to claim in order to turn this into what you want to turn it into. Okay, just before I respond to this, so then do you think then that the Whiskey Rebellion or the Whiskey Insurrection, was that not a rebellion or insurrection then in your eyes? People His thing is kind of, wait, I'm sorry, wait, wait, say that, that again? You're, you're, I think you're it's a rebellion. I think it's a rebellion. I don't think I would call it an insurrection. I think it's perfectly fine to call it a rebellion. I would have to look a lot more into the facts of exactly what happened with the Whiskey Rebellion. I, don't ha I haven't thought about that question before. But I think the word rebellion is vague enough that any kind of protest could be called a rebellion. I mean, people who are protesting and interrupting political events and going to the White House and begging on the fence against the war in Israel and the U.S. support for it are rebelling against U.S. policy. I don't have a problem with that term. Okay. But I have to look at a lot more closely yeah. at the Whiskey Rebellion to be able to say definitively That's fine. whether okay. I regard that. If you want to make these arguments that any protest can be called a Kuwa rebellion, you're free to make that argument. But you have to understand that you are using it in an ahistorical way that no legal, legal scholar, that nobody who's passed laws in Congress that refers to an insurrection or rebellion, literally nobody in the legislative or historical conduct in the United States has used rebellion or insurrection to mean protest. That has just never been the case. It is that's entirely- That's not my argument at all. What? That's not my, my argument. That's not my argument at all. My argument is that what happened on January 6th was a protest. That's fine, but and I'm saying that you're, what you just said, what you just violent. said, any two people knocking on a fence might be considered a rebellion or insurrection. That can be your no, assessment, that, or that the Whiskey what? Rebellion wasn't, was, a, was a rebellion, but not an insurrection. That might be your uh, assessment, but at the time, it was known as the Whiskey Insurrection, which was around the time when people were drafting the 14th Amendment. So I would think that their understanding of what an insurrection was at the time is probably a more important analysis than what your personal subjective and convenient interpretation of what an insurrection might be right now. You're, you, I, now you're just ranting. I mean, this claim that like everyone who was ever involved in the lawmaking process or the legislative process sees the term as you do. You, you, we can agree, just like to set this fact straight, that Jack Smith, who charged Donald Trump with many crimes, including crimes that were considered quite aggressive from a prosecutorial perspective, like he was not a overly cautious prosecutor, but a quite aggressive one who stretched a lot of theories to accuse him of certain felonies, he chose not to accuse Donald Trump of a crime that is in the US code, which is participating in or inciting an insurrection. You agree that that's not part of what Jack Smith charged Donald I agree Trump that Jack with, Smith right? hadn't charged him with that, but whether or not somebody did something isn't relevant Why to not? a particular Why criminal not? charge. Do you have an, say, well, well, I mean, I mean there's two reasons. Well, one is because, because all members of the lawmakers are on your side. Why didn't he? 
Be, well, because one, if we're talking about, for instance, the 14th Amendment, a criminal conviction isn't relevant here. We don't need a criminal conviction for the- No, I'm asking you why Jack Smith, I'm not talking about the, the banning from the ballot. That'll be a U.S. Supreme Court decision. Mm -hmm. And the courts have thus far split on that question. Democratic mm -hmm. judges in Colorado, and then secretaries of state in California and Rhode Island, both have taken the opposite position. I'm not asking you about whether he should be stricken from the ballot or you need a, a criminal conviction. I'm asking you, why did, not, why did Jack Smith an extremely aggressive prosecutor in these cases, not charge Donald Trump with inciting or participating in an insurrection. It could be for a variety of reasons. It could be that that's what, a question. Give me some. Do, you, I, do you have I, an I'm, idea? Well, I was, I was about to, but then you cut me off. Yeah. Go it ahead. could be that he feels like he doesn't have enough strength to secure a conviction for insurrection. It could be that if you actually read the statute um, for insurrection, even the, the criminal statute itself is like kind of vague because it uses insurrection like in the statute of insurrection. It doesn't really give much guidance as to what it is. Nobody in the history of the United States has ever been charged with that particular particular crime. Um, and it, yeah, it could just be that he felt like there was an easier prosecutorial path to go. You're not seriously making, you're not of the contention right now that if somebody isn't charged with a particular crime, nobody thought they did it, right? You don't think that prosecutors just think that we're going to charge you with everything we think you did, right? You understand no, that I when people think, are charging I, I crimes, they're no, charging I, what they I, think they can get a conviction on, yeah? Yes, having worked in the legal profession as a lawyer for okay. more than a decade, I do actually understand that sometimes prosecutors opt not to charge people with crimes, even though they may think they're guilty. What I'm saying okay. is this specific case of a prosecutor who has demonstrated an eagerness to be extremely aggressive in the charging documents, including bringing crimes that many legal experts, including ones who aren't pro-Trump, believe is quite a stretch and will be very difficult to prove in court, opted not to charge Donald Trump with participating in or inciting an insurrection. I think your answer is actually correct, that he believes it would be very difficult to prove that what took place on January 6th was an insurrection and or that Trump participated in or incited it. And I think it's an extremely important point. It is not dispositive. Maybe Jack Smith had suddenly some kind of like secret motive that made him not do that, but everything we know about Jack Smith and what he was doing in these cases, I think leads us to at least acknowledge that that's pretty relevant. That not only Jack Smith, in fact, no prosecutor, despite being very aggressive and wanting to convict Donald Trump of crimes, chose to accuse him of that crime. And I do think it's worth being asking, why not? If Donald Trump actually incited an insurrection, as you believe, I would hope that the prosecutor would charge him with that crime. But I agree with Jack Smith's decision not to because I think it would be very close to impossible to prove that that was an insurrection that he participated in or incited. So if all these legal theorists and legal scholars that you're so well acquainted with unanimously agree with your view, why wouldn't Jack Smith do that? Are you angry Jack Smith didn't charge him with that? Uh, I would want Jack Smith to pursue, it's a federal court, so I'd want him to pursue whatever charges he thinks he can get Trump the most on, not just any particular thing that he thinks he might have done. There might be a number of political reasons why he decided not to go the insurrection charge route, least of all the fact that it would be the first time a criminal charge like this has ever been attempted to be used in the entire history of the United States, and also because it might actually call into question too much, uh, you know, what is First Amendment speech versus not, and trying to convict a former president or something like that might be a really hairy political question that the federal courts, for whatever reason, feel like they just don't want to get involved in. So they went on what they felt were more more solid legal grounds that wouldn't put them, uh, you know, in the eyes of the American public right during an election that would cause force them to have to answer essentially an incredibly difficult political question regarding protected speech, which is why I like the route that Jack Smith went, where he's going after, uh, I think, much cleaner legal questions relating to obvious matters of obstruction um, that are, are cleaner and simpler than trying to define, you know, what is insurrection when the statute itself doesn't even necessarily call it out. But again, to recenter this idea that because he didn't charge for a particular crime, we can't say that J6 wasn't an insurrection, just again, doesn't make sense when no one has ever been charged with insurrection in the United States. I think we all agree that uh, the Civil War was at the very least an insurrection, if not a full on rebellion. Nobody was charged after the Civil War with insurrection as a crime. It doesn't mean we don't think that they weren't insurrectionists, right? Right, for political, for political reasons, but in the case of Jack Smith, and I want to let this go because my argument is not that it's dispositive. My argument that is that it's rather relevant. Now, can I, let, me ask, let me ask you this question. This is something I was really trying to pursue in the last debate. I, I don't think we ever got to have a dialogue on it, so I just want to return to it, which is the following. If Donald Trump, let's assume that you are right, that Donald Trump had an intention to incite a coup or an insurrection in the United States that he was hell-bent on breaking the law in order to cling to political power. There were all sorts of things that he not only could have done, but that typically people trying to perpetrate coups in almost every case do do. 
namely, right up until the time that he peacefully walked out of the White House on January 20th before noon, which is the time when the peaceful transition of power occurs, Trump was the commander in chief of the armed forces. He was the head of the executive branch, which means under his command, he had the entire US military, all sorts of agencies that are very well armed and very trained and all of whom are duty bound to obey his orders. Maybe some of them would have refused, but probably a lot of them would have obeyed. A lot of them were probably on his side. We heard for years how there were all these fascist and white supremacist factions within these military units. Why do you think that if Donald Trump wanted to per 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 perpetrate a coup, he didn't do what almost every other person capable of this uh -huh. who perpetrated the coup has done, which is order the military or these other armed agencies to surround the White House, keep anybody who tried to come and, and get him out, and ensure that he remains in power using violence or other illegitimate and illegal means. Like, why didn't he even try that? You're asking me why Donald Trump didn't order the military when he already thought uh, Milley was literally a treasonous actor for not giving him all the information that he thought he was entitled to for military grants. You're asking me why he didn't ask the military to help him when he already disagreed with so many members of the military. You're asking why he didn't ask the intelligence services to help him that he had said since the start of his presidency were engaged in Russia collusion hoax and with Peter Strzok and his text messages and with the Hunter Biden laptop that were all set against him. You're asking me the question of why didn't Donald Trump order the very parts of his government that he thought were backstabbing the most to help him ensure his coup? Is that what you just to be clear, that's the question you're asking me? Yeah, and I'll Okay, the answer, the answer many, why is because he didn't have any of these people on his side and he knew it. That's why he fired people like Comey. That's why he tried to intimidate and bully every other part of his administration that wouldn't follow him, whether it was Jeff Sessions when he served as temporary attorney general, whether, um, whether it was uh, his own, on trying to undermine his own attorney general bar when he turned against him, whether it was trying to undermine literally every other part of his government that turned against him. Like Donald Trump didn't have any friends anywhere. The idea that he wouldn't turn to, uh, you know, other members of the government to help him, like the military or the secret service agencies, or not the secret, the intelligence agencies is not only is it like well why didn't he do it well it's obvious why he wouldn't do it because he didn't think these people had his back i think the more difficult question for you is that if he really didn't think that it, there was going to be like violence at the capitol if he really didn't want any of that to happen why didn't donald trump pick up the phone and call anybody to get the national guard there to protect the Capitol building, when Pence, when when Ivanka, when Meadows went in over and over again, when other congressmen were calling him, why is it that when the violence was at its peak, why was it just him, Eastman, and Giuliani making phone calls to other congressmen to, surprise, surprise, delay the certification of the vote? Okay, I'm gonna, I promise I'm gonna answer that, but I wanna go back to the question that I posed to you first and the answer that you gave to me. Oftentimes, first of all, if it's true that the leaders of the armed forces and the intelligence community and every one of these armed executive agency branches, in, even including ATM and all D, the DEA and all these other ones, all were in the posture that they did not regard themselves as duty bound to follow Donald Trump's orders. If you're somebody, and I don't mean you're saying this had already been the case. Hold on, I can I just as a real quick, as friend you say this, um, you just as a real quick, you keep saying this, duty bound to follow Trump's orders, the oath that you take is to the Constitution of the United States, not to the President of the United States. Just to be very clear, have, go ahead. You have the right, no, the President is the head of the executive branch. He's the commander in chief of the armed forces. And he is below so the Constitution. Are, he so is below are, the Constitution. If you, if you are in the military, you are duty bound to obey orders. Now you can object if you think the order is illegal. You do actually have that right. And as I said in my question, I'm sure a lot of them would have done that. But there's no question that there are members of the military and members in these agencies that absolutely were loyal to Trump. And oftentimes what has happened in coups and those sorts of other things is that members of the various military branches or of the armed wings of the government break up into factions and often start fighting one another. That's how you get a civil war. So even if Milley or the leader of the CIA, who at that point was Gina Haspel, who he had actually appointed, would have done what you claim, which is a pretty significant threat to democracy, they regarded themselves as antithetical or adversarial to the president, not subordinate to him. There's definitely a good chance that a lot of those people who have guns and run the power structure of the United States would have answered his call and been on his side. The fact that he didn't even try is so reflective of the fact that this was not an insurrectionary intent, that he walked out of the office peacefully 
on January 20th at noon, the way every other president previous to him had done as part of the peaceful transition of power. There were so many things that he could have done. Now, tell me, just remind me what the question is that you asked that I promise you. Yeah, and before, before we do this, can I actually take a step back? Because I just want to just want to actually take a step back. So, so, Glenn, you said it wasn't an insurrection because on January 6th, there was no threat to actually overthrowing democracy or actually doing anything major. Uh, Destiny, as far as I understood from your previous response, and I want to get this clear before we move on, you're, you're saying it's not just January 6th, there's also all the events leading up to it. There, I, I, think that, I think that's maybe, a lot of it, but we don't even have to... We don't even have is to. It worth, yeah. Is it worth going into it just so we exactly know <laughs> what you what you would why you think it's an insurrection and what specific events led up to it? We, we can go into that to get to assign more uh, culpability to Trump, but we don't need that. Just on the on the events of J six itself, it is very plainly and clearly obvious, um, unless you have heavy political motivations to believe otherwise, that what happened was an insurrection. Um, they're just every single element is there, and and we can try to pivot with this like, well, usually people do this. I agree that usually people people do some things. Um, but just because usually people do something doesn't mean that it, that's always the case. As you've said yourself, you know, there are constitutional coups. Some people might consider the enabling act that, you know, Hitler did in order to become a dictator in, in Germany was a kind of constitutional coup. Some people claim that Evo Morales in Bolivia was enacting, trying to enact some sort of coup. Some people say that in Ukraine, uh, when Yanukovych left and that uh, that parliament decided to elect a new president, some people call that a coup. There are lots of coups that can happen that, or, or rebellions, or not rebellions, there are lots of coups that can happen that are for a variety of reasons not involving the military. We can look at the president and say, well, why didn't he try? We can think of a number of reasons why he didn't try. Because he didn't have the support of the military, because he thought it would be incredibly risky, because he thought it would devolve into chaos. He wouldn't have a clean transition of power. Nobody here is claiming that Trump is brave. Nobody here is claiming that Trump wants to lead an armed insurrection to the White House. He wasn't. His own handlers told him that he wasn't even allowed to go to the White House, even when he begged that he wanted the Secret Service to drive him there. So for, we can think of a number of reasons of why Trump, you know, didn't actually order the military to go and show up and start killing people. What I'm curious though is, to, to my question, you asked me what my question was, why did Trump sit and watch the violence carry on at the White at the uh, Capitol building and not try to intervene, despite the fact that he had the authority, and many would argue, the responsibility to do so? Why would he sit and watch it? Well, first of all, when Trump and people think may have thought he waited too long, he realized, it took him too long to realize the significance of the events, although I don't see the events as nearly as significant as you. We've had tons of protests before at the Capitol. He knew those people were angry and had gone there to protest, but he actually did. First, he went on Twitter and he told everybody there, leave now, don't use violence. Violence is not the kind of thing Hold on, that just as a quick fact check, he did not say that in his first, he did not say that on Twitter. Yeah, he said that on, 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 in tweets on January 6th, he absolutely did. Repeating the message that he gave to the crowd before they went to the Capitol, which is, I know that you're going to go there and peacefully protest. That was the message that he consistently delivered to them, both before January 6th at the protest and after. Secondly, this again, this was a protest that turned into a riot that was quelled in a matter of hours. It started in the afternoon and it was over in the afternoon. And in order to quell it, they didn't even need to open fire. As we know now, we should have known this two years ago, but the January 6th commission purposely concealed the videos that negated the kind of narrative they wanted to feed, a lot of the people who ended up in the Capitol ended up in the Capitol because the Capitol Police opened the door. This and is just not true. Can we focus on one false fact at a time before we dive into like every conspiracy theory that for some, I don't know why yeah, people- It's not a conspiracy it theory. It is a conspiracy we theory. We've seen all we the videos. Video. I, I watched it on, on video. Which video? Everyone what what, what video did you watch? Video. The videos that were actually released finally to the public, not handpicked by Adam Schiff and Liz Cheney, once Kevin McCarthy and then Mike Johnson fulfilled their promise to make sure the public could see all of the video, oh, not the video that they handpicked. You're right. I'm sorry. You're are you talking the video, about the you're talking about the footage that McCarthy handpicked to give to Tucker Carlson that he made a 30 minute documentary no, out of? No, I'm talking about the decision by Mike Johnson, a promise he made as a condition to be a last speaker to make all of the January 6th surveillance footage available to the public not just the hand-picked parts that Liz Cheney and Adam Schiff decided to show us. It was all an effort from the very beginning to lie in order to exaggerate and make this event seem much worse than it was, including this insane claim that was an absolute lie that Brian Sicknick was murdered by a savage mob of Trump supporters when he had his skull bashed in with a fire extinguisher until okay, he died. Okay, okay, hold on. One, one fake claim at a time. So, firstly, Donald so, Trump's so, initial so, tweets. Donald Trump's initial tweets were not to leave. 
And when you ask, when you when you claim over and over again that you know they managed to calm it down in three hours, it out, that was because finally, like two or three hours after everything, on Trump's, I think it was his third tweet, after being begged over and over again, after ha already having the note delivered and sitting on his desk that Ashley Babbitt had been shot and killed, he finally tweeted, "Okay, you guys can go home. We love you. You're very special. You know, congratulations." The initial and two don't tweets, use violence. the initial two tweets that Donald Trump tweeted were not telling people to go home. He already knew there was an ongoing riot and he tweeted to encourage his supporters to continue protesting. Donald Trump was the it's president of the United it's States it's who was the order. highest on the pecking what? order for delivering the National Guard to protect the Capitol building and he failed to do that. He failed to, it, to, to, to do that duty that he had that was exclusively under the purview of the president because D.C. is federal ground and he, did, and he didn't do it to stop his protesters that were there to try to delay the certification of the vote of an election that he lost. And during the that three, that that three hour time, time period, period all he was doing was making phone calls or telling Giuliani, his stooge, to make phone calls to other congressmen to delay the certification of the vote, which is exactly what he was trying to do, which is exactly what an insurrection is. It's having a large group of people oh, the, engaged in violence I mean, trying to I mean, stop the lawful is, execution of government action, which is exactly I mean, what every historical person has believed. The fact that, the fact that you have to res resort to this kind of nitpicky behavior, like, oh, he didn't tweet uh, soon enough. He, it, would, it took three whole hours to get these people very easily to march peacefully out of the Capitol is more than anything that I could do to show what an absurd farce this entire thing is. Like, Wait, you so mentioned that, other man, historical that's... examples. And by the way, like, please stop man, using our time the, to, like, constantly that's... proclaim, like, Glenn, that's everybody that's... agrees with me. It's so clearly and provably true that what I'm saying is correct. These are not arguments. Let's just, like, eliminate that fluff and try and focus on, like, the substance. You can go and do all your post videos, like, post debate videos about why you won to your audience. But for now, let's just focus on the facts. Okay, focus so on the facts. You the facts. Like, How did the first people get into the Capitol building? Were they let, let in or did let, they let break me, in? Let, let, anyway, so let, let's let go me, back to what? the tweet. I just want to focus on the tweet because, Destiny, you said that he, he actually posted tweets encouraging them to actually continue. What tweets were those? Because uh, Glenn said, of course, that was he actually told them to stop. So when, um, when, the, when the riots were going on at the Capitol, um, Mark Meadows, because other people went to him and other people, um, continued to go in, uh, initially it was to talk to Trump, and then I think Justin Meadows, because Trump had locked himself in his room, just watching what was going on, begging him to please tweet out something and stop Tell your supporters to go home. And for the first two tweets that Trump set out, he refused to tell people to go home because he enjoyed the protest, because he liked the violence, because he thought it would probably increase his chances of furthering, uh, delaying the certification of the vote. But those first but two tweets he that he it. sent, yes, after three hours when he On realized that it wasn't tweet. going to help. Yes. On the third tweet. If you look at any of the examples, even like you mentioned Bolivia, where the coup was not, according to most observers of Bolivia, that the... Evo Morales tried to stay in office. Evo Morales was given the go-ahead to run for a term by the electoral court appointed by the Constitution to make those judgments and allowed him to run for a fourth, fourth term. Evo Morales ran. He won. People in the West claimed because they didn't want him to win that, and it's so ironic, the fraud claim ended up being because he was only eight or nine points ahead and you have to be 10 points in order to avoid a runoff and win on the first round, that a bunch of Morales votes came in late at night to put him over that 10%, very similar to Trump's claim about why there was fraud. It's absolutely was not claimed. similar. The claim was that those servers that were being ran were completely and totally unmonitored, not part of any election monitoring uh, procedure, and that nobody yeah. could verify okay. any of the votes that were going you in you and out no of that server. I no absolutely know what I was talking about. And the you fact that no you say that Evo Morales was, run, was allowed to run for another term, the reason why people accuse it of being a coup is because, or why they thought it was, was because he was in charge of electing or appointing a lot of the uh, court members that would eventually go on to overturn the part of the Constitution that allowed him to run for a third and fourth term. The right, idea that he, he just let the, that the, for 12 years the court... Because he had been president, but he had been president... Let me make my point about Bolivia. He was president for 12 years. When, what happened was when he was declared the winner and even think tanks that had suspected fraud ultimately reviewed all of what happened. And the reason there were so many pro-Morales pro votes at the end is because the outer regions with indigenous and rural voters, which had always been his base, are always the votes that come in late and which is what put him over the top. But not only did I report on this, I was the first journalist to interview Eva Morales in English after those that series of events. And in order to interview him, I couldn't go to Bolivia 
You know why he couldn't go to Bolivia? Because he had been driven out of Bolivia by the military and the police that threatened to murder him and his whole family if he didn't believe, uh, leave Bolivia. He then had to go to Mexico where he sought asylum and that's where I interviewed him. And then in that next week, the interim coup government, the leaders of whom are now in prison, ended up murdering all of the, not all, but many of the peaceful protesters who were contesting the fact that the military and the police drove Evo Morales out of the country. That's what happens in a coup. When the people with the guns come and say, we're now taking over. We're going to decide who's in power. We don't care that you were certified the winner of the election. We demand that you either leave Bolivia or we're going to murder you. Every event that is seriously to under, viewed as a coup, whether the coups of in South America throughout the Cold War, the coup in Iran that has happened, you go through all over the world and you look at coups, almost always they involve not 100 people or 120 people for two hours protesting and rioting in the Capitol, none of whom pulled out a gun and discharged a weapon at any point. It involves real sustained violence by the serious factions in that country that dominate with violence. And nothing like that happened here on January 6th. The reality the was thing. there was violence on J6. You literally, we've all watched the videos. Yes. There were a small number of Trump supporters, as I said, 10% of the people how did they get in, who were engaged how, how in fighting they, with the police. How did they how get many, into the, how, how did they get into the Capitol? How many, Glenn, how, how many did people they get into the Capitol? They, they used force in order to break in. Yes. I'm not saying they, that, Okay, so saying they that, used that, force not, to break into the Capitol, okay. How did they get through the rest when cops were pointing guns at them saying, don't come in here? What were they doing? They were breaking windows. How did Ashley Babbitt get shot? They were trying to go to places where lawmakers were, where they were saying, don't come. And what did they end up doing? They delayed the certification of the vote or the execution I, I, of I, the I, law of Congress, of the Constitution. How many people How many people on January 6th? Glenn, all of these questions are bullshit. How many people? Many, is not a real that's not a real contention it doesn't matter I want to know I think it's a, I, I mean I, you 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 can not think much of my questions but I'd still appreciate if you answered them how many people on January 6 were killed by these quote unquote insurrectionists how many people did they kill on January 6 it doesn't 6? matter what how many people died in how many people died in Fort Sumter how many people died for the start of the civil war in the United States how many people died in Fort Sumter just answer to humor me how many people were killed by the insurrectionists on January 6th. I guess it depends on if you if you count them taking drugs. Is that killing themselves? <laughs> right. The, well, the only people who died, right, you can say some of them actually died and one of them was shot by the Capitol Hill police. But the people who are being called insurrectionists or the attempted coup against the most powerful militarized nation in the world did not kill a single person on January 6th. That was why the anti-Trump media had to invent That has a no lie in that, no, that stop with the weird partisan. Police officer, oh my God. It shows what a it's joke such a partisan. You're such a partisan was. hack. Just engage with the facts. Both of us agree that you don't need people to die for it to be an insurrection, right? So why do you I'm keep a, bringing that I'm up? A partisan I'm a, you're the one who goes around devoting yourself and urging people to vote for one of the two political parties. I have never done that in my entire life. The, I, I've spent the last four months attacking one of the core policies of the Republican Party, which is U.S. support for Israel. That's I don't great. go around encouraging people Glenn, to vote for the Republican Glenn, Party. Why, why does, why You're does, the one who goes around. Yes. Wait, wait, your wait, entire, can, community is can, made, your entire community is Glenn, filled with Glenn. Democratic Party partisans. True. Glenn, How dare bring, you call anybody else a partisan? That is what you are at your gotcha. core destiny. Glenn, Glenn, and, can I bring it back to, Glenn, can I bring it back to the debate? So why you said that no, why is it destiny? Let, let, let's just go back to the debate. You said that no point was this an attempted cure at all. So I just want, I know it's not exactly on January 6th, but I want to talk something about this. So there was a phone Call. Trump made a phone call to a governor, I'm sure you've heard it went really well, not really well, but it was, went quite big, of him asking to find 11,000 votes. Would you not call that at all or doing a coup or trying to bring votes to win? No, if you assume that Trump believed that there was serious voter fraud in Georgia, as he did believe and as he was being told by many of his advisors, including lawyers who had been celebrated as some of this country's most prestigious lawyers for years, who were telling him there was ample voter fraud in Georgia, he was trying to say, I don't even need you to prove that every last ballot that was fraudulent be discovered. I just need you to find 11,000. I know the interpretation that people want to give to that. They always want to try and pretend that Trump meant something sinister, like, oh, invent 12,000 cases of voter fraud so that I can win Georgia. 
That isn't all what the context was. The context was, I believe there was ample fraud in Georgia. People are telling me in an informed way there's ample fraud in Georgia. I there personally people don't believe that, that claim, be but that was the context of what that call was about. And so, I mean, if that is a coup, you call someone up and you say, I think that, first of all, this is not the first time that people have believed that elections were committed by fraud. In fact, he's going to bring up Democrats Russia believe Gate that the last three elections that they yeah. lost were illegitimate. Uh. In 1960, historians widely believe that that election was stolen by a combination of voter fraud in Chicago that made John Kennedy the winner over Richard Nixon. There it's was that every talking point, whatever you can to not engage with the actual of, of electors. substance of 1876, what's going on. Yeah. There was a huge pervasive allegations of voter fraud. You can sit there and mutter all you want, Destiny. I'm not going to play on your little field. If you don't want to look at history, you don't want to put this in context. It, the reason is, is because you have blinders on. You only know the CNN version of the world. You're one of those people who only began paying attention. Okay, so then let, let's just let's just be very clear. Then would you say, Trump. sure? Would you say that the Battle of Fort Sumter? Would you consider that the Fort Sumter event? Would that have been an insurrection to you? Even only without one person died. Else, without anything else that followed, without the yes, entire yes, without anything else happening? that followed, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I would consider that an insurrection or not. Okay, so for the whiskey the, insurrection, the where we're no Fort Sumter is because of the part that it played in the Civil War. It's the Civil War that made that so historic. For, well, that's fine, but again, your analysis there is ahistorical because people considered that others that were giving aid to Confederate states uh, as they succeeded before any actual violence happened were insurrectionists. So if you think that Fort Sumter was not an insurrection of the Civil War, followed, that's fine. That's an insane um, take. Uh, Given, especially given that Lincoln literally invoked the Insurrection Act right after Fort Sumter, but that's fine if you think that wasn't an insurrection. Okay, so for the Whiskey well, Rebellion, because, because, then, because, would you, do you think do you, for the Whiskey Insurrection that, that also wasn't an insurrection because not, people didn't die? It would, or but Fort Sumter did not just appear out of nowhere. It was not a spontaneous protest that turned into a riot. It was oh, part of part what of? became an obvious attempt on the part of the South to launch a rebellion against the North and to secede from the Union. Lincoln knew what was going to follow. And I think this is an important point. If what happened after January 6 involved acts of Donald Trump trying to extend what happened on January 6 by repeating violent protests or trying to threaten the stability of the United States government in all the different ways that he could have done but chose not to, had he not walked out peacefully of the White House on January 20th, we would be looking at all of these sets of events differently. That's an imaginary history that would make it more like the Civil War. None of that happened, so however. Fort Sumter, if the Civil a War riot and Donald Trump gotcha. walking out of the White House peacefully. So the Civil War, if it, or, or for Fort Sumter, for the Civil War that followed, if that hadn't had followed, even though Lincoln invoked the Insurrection Act to deal with Fort Sumter, you would say that that wasn't an attempted insurrection. That wasn't an insurrection. I mean, it's such a it's such a counterfactual and such a hypothetical that it's impossible to imagine taking Fort Sumter, tearing it out of its context of a nation that had been heading for civil war for a long time, where, where they were doing everything possible to avert it. Lincoln understood that Fort Sumter was not some isolated event of a two hour riot that was easily subdued, but knew that the entire South was armed to fight against the North take Fort Sumter and completely change every single fact and tear it out of its historical context and then trying to debate whether or not it's insurrection is a child's game. Let's There's say so that let's say that after Fort news. Sumter, let's say they were crushed so hard and so fast that there was a sweeping change of mind among the states and they were like, you know what? Oof, this Lincoln guy seems serious. Let's not go to war and have hundreds of thousands of us die. And they decide to do to not do that instead. In your eyes, Fort Sumter would have then not been an insurrection. Yeah, I think there's a good analogy to that, which is the one I mentioned earlier, which is what happened in Russia, where Pregosian no, no, let's just talk about the United no, States. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, you, you want it? We're going to pivot to the U to Russia, a totally different system no, with a totally no. different set of laws, with a totally you're different. No, no, you're saying no, no. Stick to this. This is such an easy yes. It was obviously an insurrection. It was so obviously an insurrection. The idea no, that you're trying to argue that Fort Sumter was only an insurrection because of acts that came after is unbelievable to me. The, what came and, after was and, a rebellion. And the, and the acts that came before. The idea that Fort Sumter was analogous in any way to January 6th, even taking Fort Sumter and imagining it, nothing else happened after. That is what is ahistorical. If you're, the, 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 uh, what a real coup looks like is what Prigozhin tried to do in Russia. 
But in the context of Russian history, even in a few years from now, that will be a tiny little footnote because it never posed a serious or meaningful threat to the system of power that governs Russia. It was crushed in 12 hours, and now Prigozhin is dead. So if you have the magnitude of these events is what matters so much. Like when the very first thing you said in that first debate was you tried to create this dichotomous framework, this very reductive binary framework that either you believe, and this is almost quoting you verbatim, you said, either you believe that the insurrection was justified and that nothing wrong happened on January 6th, or you have to admit that there was a coup. And the very first thing I did when I spoke was, was linked onto that and said, that is an absurd framework. Of course, there's a gigantic difference between acknowledging that people behaved poorly on January 6th behaved in ways we wish would not happen, seeing citizens be shot despite being How many people died for, for, the, for the Procosa stuff? How many, how many people, people died fight? when he did his attempted coup? What, they shot down a few helicopters? Was it like five or ten people that died? How many people even died for that? They, 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 there were more than two dozen Russian troops that were killed. Imagine if the group of people at the Capitol had shot down actual U.S. military planes and military jets and murdered American soldiers. So for they one person, so if, how many people like, needed to die then on J6 for you to think that that was a coup insurrection? What is the number then there? The criterion for me is not how many people died. The criterion for me is how serious of a threat did it pose or does it pose to the actual system of power in the United States. And the fact that this two hour, three hour riot filled with people who were too obese to get off the couch without dropping down of heart attacks and maybe had a couple of dozen or a few dozen well-armed and well-trained people there, that it ever posed a meaningful threat to the system of power in the United States is a complete and utter joke. It reminds me so much of the people who tried to say that Russia buying a few Facebook ads or a few Twitter bots was the kind of if interference that's in the fine. democracy I don't know why you're pivoting so to no one is talking about Hillary they, or the no, laptops. It, I, like, you know what an analogy which, is? An analogy no, is when it's you not an analogy. It's a what about is and a pivot because you don't another. want to actually argue the facts of this. That's what it is. They're what not analogies. It, what, They're not the used to strength of their argument. They're used to obfuscate. The, the so just, wait, so let's, go back, let's, let's go back to January 6th. So, so Glenn said that not on January 6th, there was no actual, uh, no point in time was an actual threat to the democracy. Destiny, is that what specific point would you say, or specific example, could you say, no, this was a threat? It's a fantastic delusion. If you were to take Glenn or anybody else that has their whatever their their partisan takes on this if you would take them put them in a room with artists and animators and then have them describe what j6 was then the animators would draw i don't know i guess like 500 greenpeace activists picketing outside the capitol building with signs saying we don't like that you guys are trying to steal the election that's what it sounds like and then maybe a few of them got led in by the capitol police to walk around Thankfully, however, thank God, we're in an era where we all have videos, we all have the internet, we can see the tens of thousands of people outside screaming, we can watch the brawling with the screaming, Metropolitan screaming. Police, but that's not all they did, Glenn. We can watch them brawling with the Metropolitan Police, we can watch them breaking into the Capitol from like 500 different angles, we can watch Ashley Babbitt getting shot as she's trying to crawl through a window where lawmakers are in direct opposition to federal police shooting her, we can watch every single one of these events on unfold in real time, and it doesn't look like anything that's being described by Glenn. Instead, the only response is Glenn says, we saw the real videos because Tucker Carlson published 0.3% of the footage that McCarthy granted him that doesn't change any of the underlying facts of what we've seen. Yeah, were there oh some people God, you, that you, were walking you, you, you through really, the Capitol you, you, building you, you, because the police you, you were really trying like to that, guide that, them that, that, to that, another that, area yeah. where they could more heavily, more easily secure it? Yeah, of course. Were some people guided through and then led into a chamber because police had an easier control of that area than something else? Yeah, sure. But again, we've all seen the videos. You admitted yourself that the first entrance into the Capitol broke in. The first people to breach the barricades broke them down. Nobody was let into a new initial area because the Capitol Police let them in. They were only sometimes ushered through the building because there were more defensible positions, which is obvious if you've watched any of the video footage available of that day, besides the selected clips that people like Tucker Carlson or Glenn Greenwald want you to watch on Twitter. Again, if this was okay. so easy and so simple and there was nobody there but a bunch of fat people, how did the certification of our vote get delayed by three hours? And why were three we waiting hours. for the national oh God. For the first time in all of history. Three hours. Oh, Three as opposed hours. to what, Glenn? I mean, how did the United, how did the Republic survive? First of all, let me just. Glenn, how long was the story thing. about Hunter's laptop delayed? Let, how, let, how, many, me, like, me, how many, like, how many days was that delayed? One day. And you guys me, say that that let, was a more serious thing, right? Because Facebook, the story was delayed by one day. Come on. Facebook suppressed that story all the way up until the time of the election algorithmically. But let me just, I, I want to go back to the history of the 
what we saw with the videos because you obviously are not familiar with this history. At the beginning, for two years, all of the information that we got about January 6th was controlled by a partisan commission filled with effectively Democrats, the people Nancy Pelosi let onto the commission, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, hated Trump almost more than any Democrat did. Those were the two Republicans. Because Just as a, as a quick thing, you can't, you can't lie. That's not true. But, uh, Pelosi that, would have allowed the, others. The, Pelosi was going to allow people on there, but unfortunately, McCarthy, when he nominated five, two of those people, uh, Jim Jordan and uh, something, Johnson, I think, maybe? Um, can, can, I, can I just finish? Well, I you're just lying, though. Yeah, you can't yeah, just yeah, like, lie. You can't just say that things that are nope. lies. No, Pelosi I'm, I'm accepted gonna, people I'm, from McCarthy. Nancy, McCarthy didn't want to nominate more people. That's his fault. Sorry, go ahead. Nancy, Nancy, Pol Nancy Pelosi was the first ever Speaker of the House in 225 years to reject the nominees by the opposing party to serve on an investigative commission. It had never happened in the history of the United States. She was the first one to do it. And so <laughs> when Nancy Pelosi let's said... Let's directly ask Destiny that question. Why, why did Nancy Pelosi reject those two Republican... Why did she reject them? <laughs> So when Nancy Pelosi was forming this committee, she said that McCarthy could nominate five people. Of those five people, um, I think it was Jim Jordan and somebody Banks, two of these people, a, a lot of the J6 investigations were probably going to be analyzing their behavior specifically, and Pelosi felt like the presence of those two people on the committee would have poisoned the committee. So she told McCarthy, I accept your other three nominees, just give me two others, and they can be part of the committee as well. But McCarthy, because he knew January 6th was an insurrection, and because he knew that the behavior that day was in defensible, decided to pull all the Republican nominees and say, you know what? Screw you. I'm not going to give you anybody. You can just have uh, Kissinger and uh, uh, Cheney or whatever, the two people that I know hate Trump, so that afterwards, conveniently, people like Glenn can make this exact bullshit argument where they say, oh, well, actually, it was a completely partisan committee, so I'm going to ignore the fact that 95% of the people that were actually uh, testifying were Republicans and ignore the fact that all of this under oath and ignore the fact that all the evidence is easily available, and I'm just going to hand wave all of it by calling, par calling it partisan. Meanwhile, I'm going to believe everything that, I guess, uh, Russia Today tweets about it or everything that Tucker Carlson uh, puts on his show about it or everything that uh, I, I McCarthy like go, himself says about back. it. That was the thing. Yeah, go ahead. Eli, I, I, I just want to go back to the history of the... Sure. First of all, I'll, I'll say one more time. Oh, the Never before yeah. in the history of the Republic did Nancy Pelosi, did any Speaker of the House or Majority Leader do what Nancy Pelosi did. The prerogative of the minority party to pick their own members to serve on that commission was never subject to the approval of the opposing party until Nancy Pelosi... While the Democratic Party always claims it's upholding norms and health and tradition, decided to block the choices. And so it's true, the Republicans decided we're not going to participate in a farce where for the first time in 225 years of our history, Nancy Pelosi gets to choose who cannot be on the panel, even, that's, even though that's who we want and think will be most effective on there. And as a result, Nancy Pelosi ended up choosing those two Republicans. They were the ones willing to serve when the rest of the Republicans weren't, and it became a partisan farce. Had she allowed Kevin McCarthy's members the way every other speaker for 225 years had done, you would have had an actual bipartisan commission. As a result, the only videos that we saw were videos that were handpicked by these very partisan anti-Trump members who then were allowed to create a narrative filled with lies, beginning with Brian Signick getting his head bashed in, and then hiding the videos that undermined their narrative and only allowing us to see the videos that made it look as violent as possible. Then, Kevin McCarthy gave the rest of the video, the video to Tucker Carlson so that he could report on them. But that's not even what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that it was Mike Johnson, the newly elected speaker, who released all of the video. And only then did we see the video for the very first time after two and a half years of these people who were walking into the Capitol being led in by the Capitol Police after they opened the doors and led them in peacefully. So. You, all the, you can say all of these things about January 6th. I said from the very beginning that your tactic is to create this binary where either someone has to Hold say Hold on, wait, if you want to do facts, that's fine, but I don't, need, I don't need to announce my tactic. I said from the beginning, okay. I said from the beginning that it was a riot. There were people who were there on behalf of Donald Trump who used violence. There were police officers who ended up injured as a result, just like happened in the Black Lives Matter protest although actually police officers, at least one of them for sure, and probably a few others, were killed and the amount of injuries were far greater. I also don't consider the Black Lives Matter movement, even though it was 
a lot of people there had insurrectionary intent, anarchist groups and Antifa and others. I don't consider that an insurrection either, though I think you can much, make a much stronger case that the damage and violence that it posed to our prevailing law and order system was far greater than what happened on January 6th. So yes, you are right that some people used violence to get into the Capitol. Some people broke windows. They were screaming. They were protesting. Things that have all happened before. I don't say that everybody on January 6th behaved properly. I think a lot of them ended up properly being in prison. There were some who used violence. What is that's it when because it was a riot and not any real <laughs> threat to the stability of the United States. It's something that's being exaggerated because the thing that Democrats want to do more than anything is to say that Donald Trump is not just somebody with bad policy or bad ideology. He's an unprecedented threat to American democracy and his movement ought to be criminalized. And what were they there to pro what were they there to protest? To that. What were they there Wait, to protest? Uh, can, we, can you specifically respond to the point that Glenn made about video the videos? There, it's just oh, bullshit. Um, it's literally I, like I don't know. That's like a guy telling you that you know yesterday I saw UFOs making crop circles. You know, you're and, like, an absolute some, liar, Destiny, but, or you have no idea what you're talking about. Mike Johnson is the one who released all the videos. How sure. do you not so, know yeah, that? We, we can walk do through this. We can that? walk through this. Right we can now. walk go through Google this right very now. simply. We can walk through this so simply. It's such an easy and simple thing. Okay, so. Why do we bring up that some police officers let people into the building? There, there is only one of two possible reasons. Bring this up. One is to say that, well, the protesters weren't actually violent because they were let in, but we know that's false because we got video evidence proving otherwise. And the second is if you want to allege a much larger conspiracy that the police were actually working to allow uh, protesters or rioters into the building, of which there's absolutely no, no evidence for. Other no, than that, those, other okay, than that, the no, only no, reason, no, let me respond, let me explain right, the video. Right, I'm trying to explain right, it. Right, other right, than right, those right, two right. reasons, there is absolutely no reason to reference this video footage. Everybody knows that there were times, even before Mike Johnson and even before Tucker Carlson, we all knew that there was footage of cops leading people in some places around the inside of the Capitol building. People do this with riots all the time. We know that they were understaffed. We know they didn't have enough people to deal with all, the, all of the uh, protesters or rioters that were in the building. And we know that lawmakers were being shuffled through the back, trying to make sure that they were in secure areas that protesters weren't. So the idea that it's somehow strange or inconceivable that police officers were leading people into more defensible areas of the building just doesn't make any sense. Like, I could ask very simply, what is the point of saying that there are videos of police officers ushering people or shepherding people into different areas? What's the point of bringing that up? What, I'll, do you, what are you I'll, contesting I'll explain, there? I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. And this is like, you are the most binary thinker I've ever heard. You begin every sentence by proclaiming it is either Wait, so one can we stay or away? two, can we stay and there's no control? third or fourth or fifth. Sure, what's three, that, four, five? Neither of those two choices is my argument. The reason why it matters is twofold. Number one is it demonstrates that from the start of all of this, the media and Democrats knew that what had happened was nowhere near sufficiently serious in order to present it as some sort of an insurrectionary threat to the United States. That was why the Brian Sicknick lie was important. That was why it was so important to conceal these videos. That's why it took Mike Johnson, the Republicans taking over the House and being willing to release all the videos, not just the part that was handpicked for us by Adam Schiff and Liz Cheney to get the real story. The the second part is that the reason it's relevant is not because it proves that none of the protesters used violence. I will say probably for the eighth time that there were a small number, a minority of people who were at the Capitol and who entered the Capitol who used violence. They used violence against police officers. They uh, attacked police officers with physical force. Some police officers were injured, pretty much like happens in every protest that is turned into a riot. But what it demonstrates is that even though you have to try and reach for this maximum number, 2,000 people who entered the Capitol, the vast majority of them were not part of any premeditated plan to overthrow the U.S. government, as even the FBI's own informants acknowledged to them on that day, and I can read you the New York Times article about that that makes very clear that the FBI's informants on the ground were telling them none of this was planned, this all happened spontaneously, and that even though it is true that a small number of people who were present ended up using violence and fighting with police officers or by engaging in property damage to enter the building, the vast majority of them were nonviolent, and that is the reason why only a small percentage of them have been accused of violence. And the reason that matters is it goes to the question of the magnitude or the extent of the actual threat that January 6th posed to the American Republic and to our system of government, which was extremely trivial and minor, both in the context of our own history and how other coups happen in other countries as well. 
Okay, so none of this was a response to anything. So, and none of these points even make sense. So the first thing you say is, is it demonstrates from the start that Just the media and Democrats bullshit. knew well, what happened. You're the winner. Hold Just on. get to the point. D you said Stop in the beginning. You're the winner every minute. I know that you're None scared. I know you're scared relevant. of talking it's about the facts. Empty. Glenn, I know you're scared Just of the facts, but that's okay. Let's follow them. Let's be brave. Let's be brave. Not okay? the part where you call yourself the winner every I'm five not, seconds. Let's be brave. Okay. So you said that it demonstrates that the media and the Democrats knew what happened wasn't sufficiently serious. That was the first one you brought up. How does the release Correct. of the videos make the event less serious? Did, was there not a delaying of the certification of the vote? Were there not thousands of people inside the Capitol? Did they not break in to get there? There weren't thousands of people inside the Capitol. You yourself put the maximum number at 2,000. What, what does thousand S mean, Glenn? Number of Hold on, you're, maybe English might be your second language. I'm trying to figure out. What does thousand S mean? Thousands, 2,000 is thousands. There were thou I'll say okay. 2,000 makes it feel better. So and we know that the there maximum, were- That's the maximum number. What the videos show is that a at least a significant number of those people did not use violence in order to enter the Capitol. They walked in peacefully you know, hold on. and were led If somebody in by breaks the into the building, the people that come intent. in afterwards, of course, are coming in peacefully in any riot situation led like that. Led in by the, the police. Led in by the police. The police are not. So, but the initial entry into the Capitol was a break in. Yes, a small percentage of the people on January 6th. No, no, no but, but Glenn, what the, Glenn, what Destiny is trying to say is that the first people who will come in will do the violence and the rest of the people will just follow them in and won't do all the violence. So the first person. It's like saying a thousand people go in through a broken door and saying well, only one guy broke down the door. A thousand people were trespassing through a broken door. Like, do you think the cops, for the cops, they were leading them around the Capitol many, building? Do you know how many political protests have involved? Oh my God, the pivot, the whataboutism. None of them to try Again, to, none of them you, to try to this, prevent the execution of the election. That's why this is a historic event. You admitted as much. Nobody's delayed the certification of a vote like this before. And nobody- It was delayed by wait, three wait, wait, hours. Wait, it happened on the same wait, day so back, as it was scheduled to, to happen. Wait a second, Glenn, can you go back to the original point which Destiny made, which is that the first, if you've got those 2,000 people in the capital, only, and you said only a couple of hundred people, or maybe only 100 people will actually be violent. Now, Destiny said it's only the first 100 people that will go through, they will do the violent, and everyone else will be trespassing. Does that make sense, or what's your thoughts on that? No, because if that crowd were actually there to overthrow the government of the United States or to prevent a peaceful transition of power, they would not have marched in peacefully to the White House when the police let them in and then marched peacefully out of the Capitol when it was time for them to go, which is exactly what happened. There was no violence even needed to subdue this riot or to put an end to it. What it shows is that the vast majority of people there were peaceful protesters. They were absolutely people who believed that the election was the byproduct of fraud. They wanted their voices to be heard in Congress. They wanted the Congress to exercise what their constitutional right was in the view of many people, which was to hear claims of fraud, which is what happened in 2016 and in 2004 and in 2000. The Congress, including members of Congress, objected to the certification of votes. They most definitely were exercising their constitutional rights to protest the 2020 election based on the view that- They're it was exercising stolen. their constitutional rights. Yes. Oh, no, I agree with everything exactly. he just said. They thought the exactly. election was fraud, and so they showed up to try to protest the results of the election. And they did it Correct. with violence. Correct. Yes, that's called an insurrection. No, when you don't like how an election goes, and violence. you show up to have a riot to try to make it so it doesn't happen, that's an insurrection, yes. There were a tiny number of people. It doesn't matter the number. Why, when you pivot to irrelevant facts like this, there were a tiny number of people. That doesn't matter. It might have been 100. It might have been 2,000. It, 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 it doesn't matter what the, the tiny number means. Oh, it does matter. It does matter in terms of the gravity of this threat. And we began the discussion by your conceding that if it were a tiny number of people, like two or three, two or three it would be yes. very difficult to call it an insurrection. So for me- And yet 500 people was enough to call it the Whiskey Rebellion, even though those 500 men had no chance of taking over the federal government. That was called a whole rebellion, which is more serious than an insurrection. History, exactly. legal experts, and the Constitution does not agree with you, Glenn. You are on an island. You're, this idea that you constantly proclaim that everybody agrees with you and nobody agrees with me, and what- world are you living in your so wait, 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 even in the u.s congress the majority of people in the senate voted is, that it was an insurrection the majority of the them not a super majority the of it. so even in the congress they agreed with me yes the, 
I don't, nope. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the person that you claim led this insurrection and that everybody agrees was an insurrection is currently leading in all presidential polls to be the next president because Americans actually don't see it the way you see it. Another person who doesn't see it the way you see it Basically. is Jack Smith, oh. who had the opportunity to charge Donald okay. Trump with insurrection and chose not to. That's, so every, every, that's a good argument. I if he's really popular, it can't be an insurrection, you're I guess. Use okay. To put at the beginning of your YouTube video mm -hmm. where you're going to be like, that's everybody like, agrees land, with me, you're on an island. Land. As though Thank I'm the only one who makes these arguments. There are millions of people who think what you're saying is bullshit, Destiny. Wait, and the wait, fact wait, that wait, you wait, don't wait, know wait, that shows how insulated you are. Glenn, can we go back straight to the right, without the insults, but can we go straight back to the beginning of the debate, which is we started off with trying to define what insurrection meant. I think we, we lost that way. Uh, so, Glenn, you described uh, insurrection as something that, was, that has a potential to overthrow uh, a the serious, A serious threat to the... To the Law, the system of law and order, and to the stability of power in that country. That's is what I think an insurrection or a coup is. Destiny, would you agree with that? Basically, yeah. Basically, um, yeah. Public use of that force uh, in order by a group of people in order to hinder <sighs> or prevent the execution of the Constitution of the United States. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. Okay, so we keep going back to this, but what happened on January 6th? It delayed it for, for a couple of hours. Was that, was that trying to overthrow democracy? Was that, how, how does that qualify to be an insurrection? The reason why it qualifies is because, as Glenn accurately pointed out, the reason why the people were there was because they thought the election had been stolen from them. When they were marching down, they were chanting 1776, and they were going down with the idea that Vice President Pence would unilaterally overturn the election that they thought was done fraudulently in order to soft coup Donald Trump back into power as the rightful leader in contravention of what the Congress was supposed to do, which was the certification of the electoral votes. That was Congress's job. They were there on January 6th, specifically that day, because Donald Trump asked them to be there. They went to the Capitol grounds immediately after his speech because Donald Trump told them to go there. They broke into the Capitol building because they thought that they could delay the certification of the vote. And then when they were there, they only left when Donald Trump told them to. And a lot of them had said in much in all of their convictions that they were waiting for his orders to go home, of which his first two tweets weren't. They were encouragement to continue writing. And they continued to do so even an hour after Donald Trump, the one who's authorized to deploy the National Guard to the Capitol grounds, sat and watched them do it even an hour after finding out that Ashley Babbitt had died. Again, if you want to say that that two people is an insurrection not sure that's fine but 2000 is way over wherever either of us would reasonably draw the line do, do, uh, we've, i think we've gone over sufficiently the amount of people who were actually there engaging in violence of any kind with any kind of an insurrectionary intent which is the uh, i'll be generous and say that 100 or 120 of them were being but can i just establish a point of agreement because i've never heard you actually acknowledge that this was true that in this speech, you're trying to depict these people as kind of like mindless zombies who just follow the orders of Donald Trump and do whatever he instructs them to do. Do you agree that, and can you acknowledge that in his speech, there was one time and one time only where he addressed the question of whether or not violence should be used at that protest they were going to at the Capitol? And when addressing that on one occasion, he told them to go there and protest peacefully. Is that something you acknowledge is what he told them? So. I would acknowledge that. However, on my YouTube channel, we try to engage in serious political analysis. So when I'm engaging in oh, serious you're political- well known for that. I know, yeah, as are you, I guess. Uh, while we're engaged in serious political analysis, when we're looking at what is actually going on or what's in the minds of people, I would never in my entire life imagine cutting one sentence out of an hour long speech to try to determine what the actual motivation of that speech was. What I would do is I would look at the totality of the speech. It's possible you've never watched it before because you only read Twitter headlines. Maybe, um, and, I, and I would also I would also look at the I would also look at the actions that happen after of both the protesters and the guy who incited the speech to see you know what were the actual intentions of what was going on in that speech. Donald Trump multiple times made allusions to the fact that our democracy was under threat, that our election had been stolen, that Congress was failing the people to act in how they should, and that Vice President Pence was the last hope of saving our republic, and that if you don't fight like hell, they're going to steal your country from you. So I also know that Donald. Trump was informed by the Secret Service that there were people trying to get into the protest or, or trying to get into his ellipse speech that were literally armed and had guns. The Secret Service said, we can't let them in. Donald Trump said, let them in. They're my friends. I love these people. That's fine. And I also know that after the speech, when Donald Trump told everybody to march to the Capitol, when they were marching, they were marching, He's chanting funny. rebellious, rebellious slogans. Uh, you know, they were saying 1776. You know, they were looking to have a rebellion because as you said, they thought the election was stolen. When they got there and Vice President Pence didn't unilaterally toss the election, 
election, what did they do? They said, hang Pence, hang Pence, hang Pence. Pence himself called Trump to complain about this. Trump didn't check it on him a single time that entire day because he was so upset that Pence wouldn't unilaterally toss the election. So when I look at the totality of the events, am I here to say that because he said march to the protest peacefully, that means that it was peaceful? If that was the case, then as soon as Donald Trump saw violence, you know what he would have done? Donald Trump would have made a phone call and he would have said, uh, Miller, why is the why is the National Guard not there right now? What's going on? I, my daughter-in-law is talking to me. Everybody, or my daughter is talking to me. My chief of staff is talking to me. My lawyers are talking to me. Uh, people from Congress are calling me. Everybody's calling me saying violence happening. Why aren't you guys stopping it? He didn't do that. Instead, what he did was he had a two-minute conversation with Giuliani, and then Giuliani started ringing up all these congressmen saying, hey, don't you think you guys should delay the vote? Give us 10 days. Right? What is that? Capitalizing on violence to circumvent the constitutional transfer of power from one president to the next, also known as an insurrection. It's so clean and it's so easy. And none of the facts that I just gave, by the way, Glenn will not contest a single one of them, even though all I'm of those go, facts I'll, are in the politically right partisan J6 committee. How crazy is that? Tell, tell me when you're done talking yes. and I will, I will immediately contest. Glenn, the, Glenn can you particularly respond to what you said? So, Len, can you respond to those, particularly I, I, the two yeah, things? Yeah, absolutely. No, well, I, from, I, I yeah, am, yeah. I'm, ve I'm very surprised that your incredibly substantive discussion on a YouTube channel led to a conclusion that was the most negative possible about a Republican candidate that would be completely unpredictable. But I'm going to tell you why in everything that you just said, we can get back to the question and be able to answer the question of why it is that Jack Smith did not actually charge Donald Trump with doing what you claim he did, which had he done would have been a very serious crime and I think he should have been charged for. The reason is, is because in what Donald Trump actually said, as opposed to all the secret meaning that you and your Democratic Party community believe he intended to convey through very banal political slogans like, go fight like hell, is the only thing he actually told them was that they should go and march there and be peaceful when they went and protested. And you know what? The vast majority of people who marched to the Capitol did exactly what Donald Trump told them to do, which was to be peaceful. There were. A ten, let's say 10,000 or 15,000 people uh, outside the Capitol, and you said before they were yelling, which actually is constitutionally permissible and protected. You're actually allowed to yell at politicians when you're angry about what you perceive to be a political injustice. Of those, a small percentage actually entered the Capitol, and of those, a very small number of people used non-fatal violence against police officers, something that we had watched occur for months at the through the summer and into the fall of 2020, over and over and over and over again, when thousands of Americans were injured as part of a nationwide protest movement that repeatedly ended up engage with, with the protesters engaging in violence against the police. This, as I said before, I don't regard the Black Lives Matter uh, movement as an insurrectionary movement, I would never call it a coup, but by every metric, it would be so much easier to call that, to make that case about the Black Lives Matter movement than it would be about January 6th in part, in large part, because the number of people actually involved in trying to use violence was very Listen, small. Nobody... Even the people who used violence were not engaged in even the kind of violence that you often expect, which is, again, pulling out guns, shooting people. There was none of that. That's why nobody died on January 6th except for four pro-Trump protesters. So yes, there was violence on January 6th. Yes, they were there because they believed that the election was stolen. Yes, they ended up delaying this ceremonial ministerial process by a grand total of two hours or two and a half hours. But while it was a riot perpetrated by a small number of people, it never got even close to threatening the levers of power of the United States, the most militarized country on the planet, and that is why it is an absolute joke to try and put it up there with the major historical events of the United States, let alone the kinds of coups or attempted coups that take place all around the world that always involve universes greater levels of violence and threats to the status quo than January 6th did. Wait, so Destiny, just before you continue, I want to go back to what you said because I think it's really important. You made two. Wait, can I ask one quick question for, and then you can ask my thing? Glenn, if yeah, they would have managed to kill like one lawmaker, would you call it an insurrection then? If they had like killed like Nancy Pelosi, because the government could still continue, like everything could still go on, it's fine. I mean, I would need some context. Like, was it one rogue guy like who found Nancy Pelosi and shot her? Was it like a huge group of thousands of people dragging her out and hanging her in the public square if, while they're here? If, no, if, if someone was killed, like, in, I, in, I, in, I would need the context. Oh my God. 
Okay, sorry, what was your question? Okay, so let's, just let, let's go back there, up. There, there have been po politicians killed before, assassinated in the United States before, uh -huh. and we didn't call those insurrections. Because they probably weren't a group of people trying to prevent the lawful execution of exactly. power in which the United States. Yeah. Would need the con which sure. is why I said it would need the context of... Oh, like a group of people, like Trump's audience, trying to circumvent the legal execution of the Constitution? That's like that context? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Wait, so let, let's go back to Destiny. You made two, two points before, mm -hmm. and I want to stick on those because sure. actually a good points we need to go over. Number one is Trump's full speech, the context <laughs> of the speech, and what he actually said. And number two is the National Guard. So let's go back to Trump's full speech, which he started on, Glenn, but let's actually continue on, on that point. Uh, so, you meant, so, so Destiny mentioned that if you look in the context, he was actually inciting people to go there, um, not, not just peacefully. Uh, would you agree that makes sense, or what's particularly on the, particularly your thoughts? Do you think he was just telling people to go peacefully, and that was it? Why didn't he tell them to go yeah, home when they were unpeaceful? Are you asking me? Yeah. Why didn't yeah, they? Why yeah, didn't tell them to go home when they yeah. when they were right, riding? I, I'm trying to I'm trying to answer, but since you're talking, I can't. I, the way I interpret a speech is I look at the words that are spoken by the person delivering the speech. And when someone stands up in front of a crowd and says, I want you to be peaceful when you go on this protest that you're about to go on, that the Constitution permits you to go on, I take that seriously as an instruction given to his followers not to go there and use violence. And the attempt to suggest that, as I said before, phrases that politicians use in almost every political speech, like, let's fight like hell, and let's get our country back, things that Joe Biden said over and over in the 2020 campaign and many times before, that somehow that was like a secret code to go tell those people that what I really want you to do, even though I just told you to be peaceful, is in fact go and use violence, is something that you have to be delusional in order to find. And apparently that is not what the crowd heard since the vast, vast majority of the people who went to the Capitol, in fact, did not use violence. Only a very small number did. So then the easy That's question, bad. wait, on the, on the back of that, just an easy question then. Yeah. If he, re first of all, also, no one is saying he's speaking a secret code. Everybody understood, apparently, loud and clear, uh, to go to the White House and protest. That's why thousands yeah. of people, or I'm sorry, the Capitol building protest. That's why thousands of people went in. Uh, but the question would be, let's say that I grant all of that. Let's say every single thing you just said is true. And Trump really did just want them to peacefully protest. Why is it that when the rioting had started and people went to him begging him, please, Trump, and tell the, or, Trump please tweet and tell these people to go home, why would he not do it? Well, he did do it. Your argument After is that- After hours, oh, no, 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 do don't lie. Glenn, why are you lying? Why are you, you lying right up, now? Can you shut up and well, let but me you're, But you're your lying. Questions? Okay, go ahead, you no, can lie, go ahead. You, yeah, just let, let him respond and then respond after. I think you've lied probably a hundred times. Really, name of one. you a liar, what I try and do is go instead- What have I lied and about? Demonstrate what the actual arguments are because I don't feel a need to constantly okay. declare right. myself the you winner. Have, to be clear, you so haven't contested a my, single the, fact the, I've given because I've been correct that, on the everything. The reason but. that I think that, the reason that I believe that Donald Trump delayed telling those people to go home is because for a long time he saw it as a legitimate protest, including people going into the Capitol. So if this entire case now rests on the fact that Donald Trump should have posted a tweet an hour earlier than he should have, and that that way the riot would have dispersed after two hours rather than three hours, I think that illustrates the triviality on which we're actually having this discussion. These kind of reaches to try and say that the reason this was an insurrection and Trump tried to overthrow the government or seize power illegally is because he tweeted an hour after you think that he should have tweeted. That is, I mean, we're talking about the smallest details because that's I, all you have. You're mistaken. You're, you're mistaken. When you say that it illustrates the triviality, that's not true. What it illustrates is how childlike Trump is, that our only expectation would be to pray for him to tweet to send his followers home. What his actual constitution, hours did. after the rioting had carried on. Donald Trump is the head of the National Guard that ought to have been deployed to DC and he failed to uphold in his duty to do that. Instead, he sat and he watched and he prioritized his own political career by telling Giuliani to make phone calls to congressmen instead of executing his duty as the commander in chief to deploy the National Guard to DC for hours. So you are right in one sense that begging for a tweet is a bit trivial, but what it really trivializes is Donald Trump's competency and the expectations of him even as a president. Because you're right, a tweet would have been that, trivial and it wouldn't have been enough. He should have taken charge as president and that's 20 fine. or 30 no, minutes after violence happened, he should have called in the National Guard 
guard to stop it. He sat there for an I, hour after Ashley Babbitt died and watched it rage on before he, before he finally made the tweet telling people to go home. How How is that okay. at all compatible with a president that wanted to be peaceful? I have a question for you. So I don't mind arguments that Donald Trump should have been faster in deploying the National Guard or dispersing the riots and the riot would have only been 90 minutes or instead of three hours. But let me ask you this question. If in fact Donald Trump were trying to lead a coup and an insurrection in the United States, why did he go at all onto Twitter and tell those people to leave peacefully? Why didn't he go and say, you know what? We're currently seizing control of a corrupt government, and therefore I want even more of you to come to Washington and go join these patriots in engaging in violence. Why did he call it off? Why did he tell them for the third time or the second time that day, don't use violence, be peaceful, and go home. That does not sound to me like the kind of statement that somebody intent on a coup would actually be issuing. I've never heard of a, per a perpetrator of a coup before telling the crowd beforehand to be peaceful and then telling them two and a half hours later again to go home and be peaceful. He, it's, it's because he knew he didn't have the support for it. It's so obvious because Donald Trump doesn't want to actually be caught in the middle of military conflict. He was looking for an easy win and he didn't get it and as he saw that his supporters were failing, eventually you know, he kind of encouraged them when people were begging you know, please, you know, tell him to go home and then he starts tweeting out how Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done instead of telling him to go home when it looked obvious that his little attempt had failed. He's not going to go out there with an AK-47 and start fighting with the supporters. He, and he doesn't want to leave obvious, clear evidence on Twitter. Guys, go coup the government. So of course he speaks, you know, a little bit out of both sides of his mouth and he eventually tells people to go home because he failed. That's so, it's so obvious. Such an obvious reading of the fact. But he, ended up, but he ended up doing exactly the thing that you said a real leader would have done. Your argument is that he did it like an hour late. No, why do you keep saying one hour late? It was like three hours after the protest, the rioting had started. And that's a long time when he's getting, and it's also not just that the, he waited that time period. It's that when congressional leadership and congressional people were calling him and his family, he was making fun of them. What was it? I think it was even McCarthy that made the phone call where he was like, hey, what's going on with your followers out here? And Trump was like, looks like they're a little bit more mad about the rigged election than you are. Like, holy shit. Like, these are insane statements to be making when instead Donald Trump should be saying, hold on, let me get the National Guard over there as the guy that's literally in charge of it. It's pretty crazy what's happening right now. I have been tasked all of, all as part of my oath so to the Constitution. Of, yeah, it's what is, just so far removed from like what any country would ever describe as a coup, what any historical historian would describe as a coup. Uh, no, well, hold on, wait, 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 you're wrong. Hold on, to be clear, I don't care coup. about any other country. I'm, I care about the United States. This is my country. And insofar as what a historian would call a coup or a rebellion, again, you are on an island there. You don't think the Whiskey Rebellion was a rebellion. Not enough people died. You don't think that Fort Sumter would have been an insurrection without the Civil War after it. It's only retrospectively, say, uh, it's only retrospectively, you know, determined. And also you think that you think that Donald Trump wasn't an insurrection because he wasn't charged with insurrection, even though nobody from the Civil War was charged with insurrection. Glenn, you are completely on your own legally here you, with nobody in your corner you, you've come again this is what you do like you're like you're alone nobody agrees with you talk that about the number of people who are violent again of, glenn go ahead of talking i'm gonna let my statements speak for themselves about what i said about fort sumter and your imaginary fort sumter that you wanted me to analyze and all the other things i said what you just said i believe is a complete distortion of what i actually said but i'm not interested in bickering about that since there's a videotape that everybody can watch and i see what i actually said Yes, the reason why we look at other countries, I don't know if you know this or not, but the State Department calls what happens in other countries all the time coups and insurrections. They condemn coups and insurrections under the law. We punish and impose sanctions whenever a government enters in a way that we call a coup or an insurrection. So we have created a long history of how this term is actually used. And this is what I was saying at the start of our discussion, which is that if all you want to do is have history begin with 2016 and Donald Trump and only look at the United States and partisan politics, then you will end up definitely catastrophizing everything associated with Trump. That's basically what the media has done for the last seven years, is trying to pick Donald Trump as a never before seen evil. The reality though, is that there is a long history, which I think is critical to consult with and resort to about how these words have always been used independent of Trump and prior to Trump, including by the American government that you're a part of or that is your government because you're an American, there's a long record of how we use these terms. And there is no case 
in which we would resort to trivialities like the leader waited an hour too long to tell people to go home, or there was a protest that turned into a riot that delayed the certification of a, an election by three whole hours, and now we're going to impose sanctions on countries because we believe that there was some kind of an insurrectionary attempt that was serious in nature. Yes, if you just look at everything in isolation and say, as long as I can prove that some people on January 6th did something bad, which is that framework at the beginning, you try to create this binary framework, then it means that I win, then yeah, that is, I agree. You can definitely prove that there were people who did bad things on January 6th. But when you look at it in the context, this context that you insist should be ignored, of historically how we've used these terms, both in our own history and in the history of other countries, it is a joke to try and apply those terms to this three-hour riot. So, so Glenn, let me ask you a question about that. So uh, about the three hours, about waiting three hours to do the votes, they did it three hours later. So instead of a full insurrection, is that at least, could you say that's an attempt to, to, uh, to prevent the peaceful transfer of power? No, I think it would be a, a preposterous statement to draw from that conclusion. I think if Trump didn't walk out of the White House peacefully, as he did on January 20th, and had in the interim tried to incite or encourage more violence on the part of the people in the government and in the military who were loyal to him to engage in violence in a way that he really actually tried to stay in power, then I would be more open, more amenable to the idea that this was actually an attempted coup or an insurrection. The fact that political protests delay important proceedings all the time, that's in fact one of the purposes of political protests is to be disruptive, to make the people in the government understand that there are people in the citizenry who are angry about a perceived injustice. That is often the goal of political protests. And if the goal of this protest was to delay by a couple of hours a certification that is ministerial in nature and that happened on the exact day the Constitution requires it to happen, if that's all we're arguing about, then to me it settles the whole case. That what was the is goal of the protesters? A complete joke. What were they there to, to protest? To make themselves heard. I believe they were there to, to make, make themselves, themselves heard about heard. what? What were they there to make themselves heard about? About the fact that they believed that Donald Trump was the legitimate winner of the 2020 election and that Joe Biden had and the Democrats had engaged in fraud okay. in the election in order to win that that election. So they didn't believe and that in therefore, the, Yeah. So they didn't believe right. in the outcome of the election. They showed up to protest the outcome of the election. Violence Correct. was used and they delayed the certification of the vote. Right? Do we? Do you disagree with any of those yes. facts? That, all, all of those happen. No, I do not. No, no. Okay, which which one of those four? Okay, oh, those we'll facts. go over them again. Okay, you agree that they were protesting the results of the election? I just said I don't agree. I don't no, disagree. He, with he said any he of agreed with all of them. He agreed. He you agree with all four of those facts? Then what part of this is not an insurrection? What are they, the what's missing? That it's a complete. The fact that the number of people who engage in violence and the way they engage in violence was very similar to how protests often turn into a riot. It is universes away from any kind of actual <clears throat> serious threat I agree. credible no, no, to the Glenn, power of the United States. We agree that, that this was a riot. No one is denying this was a, this this was was a, a riot. At, yes. Right, it was a, it was a riot. Yes, Whenever it was riots, a riot. It, it bring in violence into yep. the political system and one of the protesters, an unarmed protester, ends up dead mm -hmm. and police officers end up injured, it's a lamentable act. It's something we don't want to encourage. It's <laughs> a bad thing. But this is so much to me like the inability to say that a foreign government or a foreign leader is no doing is, bad things no, no, no one without is Abed about that. immediately calling them Adolf Hitler and not understanding that there's a difference between a bad event or a bad person or a bad act and what the Nazis did. Like everything has to go to the furthest extreme. No one is, no one is so taking yes, anything to a further extreme. It was a bad, violent yes, riot. riot. It was I a wish riot. It, hadn't happened, it was a riot. It nowhere near it was a riot. undermining or subverting the law, the system of law and order in the United States. It did nor undermine it. It intended to do so. Nor it did undermine it. Intended to do that. It, it was intended to do You said it. You said it, 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 they went there to protest the election results. It turned into a riot and they delayed the certification of the vote. By Every a core of hours, element. By a couple of hours. It doesn't that matter. Means, they still did it. That was the goal. That's what they did. They weren't that successful. That's not an argument if, that if it you, wasn't if, an insurrection. If you, if, you if you think that that was the goal, then I think your argument is even weaker than I thought so the first time. If you believe their goal was to delay this ministerial act by Congress to make it happen at 4.30 p.m. instead of 1.30 p.m. or whenever it was scheduled. Well, no, the goal was, was to the delay it completely. they intended to do, and that is what they succeeded in doing. Then the idea that that was an insurrectionary intent to delay a, a ministerial act, a ceremonious act, by a couple of hours so that they could have their grievances heard, then I think 
it's even a weaker case than that's, I thought so, and, having listened to you for three hours gotcha. the first time. Okay, and that's fine. But historically, uh, whether we're talking the Whiskey Rebellion, which used to be called the Whiskey Insurrection, whether we're talking about Shay's Rebellion, whether we're talking about Nat Turner's Rebellion, whether we're talking about any of the insurrections that were protesting and insurrecting against the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, whether you're talking about um, literally any of these things that were historically all understood to be insurrections that Congress was talking about in the 50s and 60s where they passed the 14th were Amendment. These were all coups? understood to be were insurrections. They were all. Were those coups? We're not talking were about a coup right now. We're talking coups? about an insurrection, aren't we? Who's talking no, about a coup? We're, no, coup is a word that we've been using from the very first second that we started talking. I'm sorry. I believe that in the beginning of this, Eli, I'm sorry, pull the tape. I mean, were we talking about defining an insurrection or a coup? No, it's an insurrection. I asked, for, I asked you for both. I started. Do you, that's, I I didn't, we haven't even gotten to coup yet. We can get to coup. If you want to get to coup, the electoral slates, no, that's a way regardless, easier regardless, argument for me, okay? Regardless, but if you're having trouble with this I've, argument, I've like. I, I, that's certainly something I've been talking about quite a bit, and I've used the word coup many times. Of course, because you're trying you to obfuscate. Yeah. It, it's totally fine. So let me ask you, do you think what happened on January 6th rose to the level of an attempted coup? Uh, firstly, I would say that, just to reiterate in the past, your understanding of insurrection is unique and ahistorical. Just to be Stop clear. Stop saying that because it's just such, it's so untrue and it's so irrelevant. Even if I were the only one who thinks it, it's not proof that I'm wrong. The idea I didn't say it was proof. I didn't say it's proof that you're wrong. agrees with you. I'm not saying it's proof that you're wrong. I'm not just saying. Not everyone on your side, not everyone is on your side, Destiny. Even though I know you sit on a YouTube channel <laughs> yeah. with Democrats and uh -huh. people who tell you that you are. That's There's right. a much can bigger can world than your can YouTube can channel. Get that So the actual, so. The, uh, so the coup part, if I were to look at coup or call it a self coup, I guess, since Trump was still in power, the coup part is going to be Donald Trump on two or three different forks. One is going to be trying to bully at least uh, seven different state legislatures or electoral bodies to change the results of their electoral votes, um, knowingly that he was working with false evidence because every single person that he entrusted to gather data about voter fraud had told him prior to the statements he made about these things that the voter fraud wasn't real. That would be the first part. The uh, second sorry, part- uh, Can you just answer first? Is what happened on January 6th, an attempt to coup. I realize there's other things. This is the, yeah, I'm, I'm getting it. This is the culmination. The, the, the second part is the um, electoral slates scheme where Donald Trump and his people basically contacted seven different slates or seven different states and got all these people involved in making and testifying to falsely being electors of these states to be sent to uh, Congress. And then the, the, I guess the climax of that would have been in Congress, Donald Trump asking Pence when he gets these fake slates of electors to ignore the real electors, say that these particular electors is too hard to figure out what's going on, and then throw it to the House to have the House essentially, because um, the Republicans were controlling the parts of the House they needed basically um, in order to uh, elect Donald Trump as the president for them to make a determination on the election. That part was an attempted self-coup, yes. Because he was contra- okay, so, yes. so so you do think your, your your argument is also that it's an attempted coup, not just an insurrection. I don't know why you got because so because the because the self coup part word. I'm explaining because the se the coup part is fundamentally separate from the insurrection part. There were two different things going on that day. All right, let me let me because I mean, I think it's a good point to kind of like summarize. We've been going almost two hours, which is like what we said was our kind of target goal. But so let me just tell you about all of that. My view of of what all those events are, which is that as has happened before in elections and American elections when people perceived or believed that there was fraud in the election and the illegitimate winner uh, was was certified and the uh, legitimate winner was declared the loser as has happened previously, Trump exercised all of his legal recourses. He was the leader of the executive branch and he went to the two other branches of government, first to the courts and then when that failed to the Congress using a theory that some lawyers had told him, and I don't mean like personal injury lawyers that he picked for that reason. No, I mean, you're lawyers sorry. who had previously been regarded as some of the most prominent and prestigious lawyers like Rudy Giuliani, not by me, but by many people celebrated for many years. And John Eastman, people like that had told him that this was a role the vice president had had. There was a incident in 1960, albeit different, that could have suggested that that was part of the vice president's duty. He went to Congress in order to appeal to the legislative power. And when that failed, when he exercised all of his legal options in the judiciary and failed and then exercised his recourse in the Congress and failed, he walked out of the White House on January 20th before noon peacefully and turned over peacefully the levers of power to the certified winner of the 2020 election, which was Joe Biden. What, real that quick, just is, on that explanation, what happened. What, what happened in 1960 that was comparable to this event? There was a dispute about which uh, candidate had won Hawaii, whether it was Richard Nixon 
or John Kennedy. First, Richard Nixon was declared the winner. Then John Kennedy, on a recount, was declared the winner as the certified vote. They sent both slates of electors to the Congress, and Richard Nixon, presiding over the Senate, like Mike Pence, serving that function, declared that the real winner of Hawaii was John F. Kennedy. The reason I say it's not comparable is because in that case, the state had certified exactly. the last so, resort. But, yeah, but, that's great. But still, so I mean, I'm actually, I'm even, no, I, I was I, hoping that you I, didn't I, know I, that. The fact I'm that you know that is even more disingenuous then. Because no, the issue with Donald Trump's slates of electors. Gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, if if, to explain to you why I cited that as the only example. I want to be clear. I don't agree with the legal theory. That but you just cited it and you didn't explain it any further until I, I asked you. Because, because, because you interrupted. Had you not No, you were done. You moved way past it. I let you move past it. No, no. The relevance is that the reason why there were well-qualified actual members of the bar who had long been advising Donald Trump on a whole bunch of legal matters had come up with this theory was because that was the one time in history after 1876 when the Electoral Act and the procedures were implemented when there was an actual dispute about which slate of electors should be chosen. And Richard Nixon, serving as the presiding officer of the Senate, was widely complimented because he actually acknowledged that the winner of Hawaii was not himself but was John Kennedy, implying that he had some discretion about which to choose. The reason I immediately said that it wasn't comparable, and it's the reason I never thought Mike Pence had the authority to do what Donald Trump believed he had the authority to do, was precisely because Richard Nixon was duty-bound to choose the actual certified winner of Hawaii, which is what he did. Nonetheless, he was complimented because he did have the ability to choose otherwise. If Mike Pence had done what Donald Trump had requested that he would do and that some lawyers told him Mike Pence had the duty to do, I have no doubt about what would have happened, which is that that would have then gone to the Supreme Court and asked the Supreme Court whether or not Mike Pence in fact had the authority to do what he did. The Supreme Court would have ruled there was no inclination that the Supreme Court had to interfere and to make Donald Trump the presidency. They had uh, the president, they had several opportunities to do and refrain. He would have lost in the Supreme Court and he would have left office just as he did once he exhausted all of his appeals in the other two bodies, branches of government, and left peacefully on January 20th. The fact that Trump left peacefully on January 20th is to me the most dispositive fact. And it was a fact that will never change. Mm -hmm. It will always be true in history. And I think we'll make the attempts to depict what happened as part of the 2020 election as some sort of serious insurrection or serious attempted coup. Nothing short of laughable. That's right fine. now, there's a lot of people they, who hate Trump enough. Yeah. They're willing to believe anything about him. But I think ultimately, that's how it will be understood. That's fine. I'm sorry. A failed coup is still a coup. Whether you leave afterwards because it failed is is that's it doesn't change the fact that the I don't coup think attempt it rises was, to that level. I don't think that's great, that but you're literally willing to retroactively literally analyze, no retroactively analyze whether Fort Sumter was an insurrection based on the events Everybody that came totally, after you would change that. Let's, but like, let's, not the, go, let's not go over the old ground that we've course, already I understand. Over. Yeah, yeah, I know. The facts are hard. But, but hold on, just in response to what he said. So you, in response to what I'm, he said, I'm on, I'm I know you're upset. Myself. I know facts are hard. I know. I'm sorry. So the reason why I'm upset that you brought up 1960 and why I'm even more upset now that you know the details of it is because the issue was never that multiple slates of electors were sent because because state legislatures almost certainly have the ability to do that. The issue was that Hawaii sent two sets of electors because it was legitimately an incredibly close, I think it was off by like 140 I just votes. Got done I understand all of that you did, but the issue with what Trump did was they had electors in these seven states falsely attest that they were authorized and duly elected by the state assemblies in order to send their electoral votes to Congress. That was a lie. It was perjury. They were encouraged to do it by people under Trump, and they did it on a bullshit legal theory from Eastman that everybody knew was bullshit. And they literally, well, they actually, yeah, that's, you can always find and not one Rudy crazy. Giuliani and not Sidney Powell. That's great. And, there's, and I'm sure lawyers. I can find a doctor that'll tell me that acupuncture will cure my diabetes. Okay. That, but just that, because you have one point. person. I don't agree, I don't just agree with those lawyers. The every point is single Trump other lawyer is telling and him Trump, it was a valid. And he had, Trump had, and he lost. Hold on. Let me finish my, let me finish my point. Let me, let me, let me finish my point. The issue is that these electors transmitted their votes to Congress falsely. They lied. And they were encouraged by Trump's campaign to lie. They were not authorized by the state assemblies like they were in Hawaii in 1960 to do so, which is why the comparison 
comparison is insane. And by the time those electoral votes got to Congress, um, the, the plan from Trump, the plan from Easton, Eastman at that point, wasn't to say that Pence could declare a winner after the uh, legitimate negotiations had happened in Congress over whether or not these electoral slates were real. The goal was to say, Pence was going to just say, hey, actually, I don't know where these came from. We're just going to go ahead and throw it to the assemblies in the House and let them decide, uh, which Republicans had 26 and Democrats had 24 state assemblies, which would have meant that Donald Trump arguably could have won the election. This is un undoubtedly a self-coup. Nobody thought this legal theory was valid. Even Eastman called it highly into question multiple times during some of the memos that he sent himself. And the only three lawyers that Trump took advice from in opposition to his entire, his actual qualified lawyers were Eastman, Giuliani, and Powell, who are so much clowns. Even people like Tucker Carlson were texting back and forth with Fox News uh, execs saying how annoying it was that Sidney Powell was making claims that they had to carry on the network because everybody knew that she was full of shit. Rudy, Rudy Giuliani spent most of his adult life as one of the most revealed lawyers and political figures in the United States to the point where people thought when he ran for president in 2008 that he was deemed the front runner. And then he John gave a speech Eastman in front of the Four Seasons Landscaping I, I, Company. I, I never thought so. I always have despised Giuliani. But the way the criminal law works is very often if a defendant is charged with some sort of criminal intent and they can prove that they had actual lawyers who were advising them that what they were doing is it was legal, that goes directly to their intent no, of whether or not they dead understood wrong. You have no idea what you're, you're talking about. You're dead wrong. Destiny. I practiced law for so many years. If you, if you okay. can prove that you have lawyer letters telling you that what you've done is actually legal and is highly relevant in a court of law as to whether or not you had criminal intent because people are expected to rely on the advice of their counsel to understand what the law is. I think Trump's theory, for the reason that I explained mm -hmm. well before you took 10 minutes to do so, was baseless. But he gotcha. thought it was okay. valid because he had My lawyers mistake. who were telling him okay. that it was. You're right. Okay. That's okay. Maybe you're right there. You're the lawyer and I'm not. Can you tell me what is it called if I do a thing with a lawyer where we both make a plan to break the law? What is that called, Glenn? Oh, if you have, if you have lawyers who are giving not only deliberately false advice, but false advice that the client knows is false just to create a fraudulent scheme that you had legal counsel, that then will of course be relevant to the question of whether or not that person had criminal intent. But in this case, these lawyers were not, again, these were not personal injury lawyers that he just pulled off the street and paid a bunch of money to to write a letter that he told them to write. These were lawyers who had operated at the highest levels of the United States government, who had been regarded as highly prestigious Correct. lawyers who graduated. But they're the also indicted in, in some country. cases as co-conspirators. So now, if they're indicted as co-conspirators, you can't use the fact that they're giving you legal advice because you seek them out for that particularly legal advice, trying to break the law. You can't use he, the excuse the that their lawyer is giving you advice it is literally accused. one of the key exceptions At to, to uh, attorney client privilege glenn he had not been accused of that he had not they had not been accused of fraud. they hadn't been accused of it when they were the breaking the law that's normally how breaking the law works yes correct usually when you're in the process of breaking a law you're not being accused currently of doing it but right, he was so working at, time, at advice at that was being time, at the time if you look at it from trump's perspective which is what the law requires required to do to determine not whether he was wrong in the theory that he embraced but whether or not he knew that it was illegal and pursued it anyway the fact that he had not only various members of the bar, but three lawyers who had long been regarded as highly prestigious, who graduated some of the most the best law schools in the country, who, in the case of Rudy Giuliani, was one of the most revered public figures for decades in the United States. I believe he was Time Man of the Year once. He was as celebrated as you will ever find after 9-11. He had actual lawyers who were giving him this advice, writing legal memos about why Mike Pence had that theory. When Mike Pence concluded otherwise, Trump accepted his defeat and left the White House peacefully. He had re resorted to all the legal recourses that he believed he had, that lawyers told him that he had, and when those were exhausted and he lost, mm -hmm. he didn't order the military to keep him in power. He walked out of the White House so then peacefully. what? So you're a fan of using one sentence to incriminate somebody or, exo or exonerate them. When Pence and Trump were talking, what, what and Trump what, said, what "When Trump said, what did well, you, be, say? you said you're a fan of you're a fan of using one sentence to either exonerate or convict somebody, I guess, because when Trump said peaceful, march peacefully, peaceful. you think yeah. that's okay. So the peaceful thing completely exonerates Trump from the hour minute rile up that he did before the insurrection. That's fine. When Trump was talking to Pence and Trump said, "You're too honest, Mike," after asking for like the fiftieth time to decide the election on his own, what did Trump mean when he said that? I have no idea if that's being conveyed accurately. I have no idea what Trump's intention was, but we have all kinds of 
evidence that Trump vehemently believed that the advice he was given by lawyers was advice that he found persuasive. It wasn't just whispered to him. It was conveyed to him in the form of legal the uh, memos of the kind that lawyers write That's all the time to true. lay out the arguments. And there not were not true. just three lawyers in the United States. Eastman the literally that thought theory, that their little scheme as well. Eastman it's literally thought their scheme would get overturned to the Supreme Court. He knew it was bogus legal theory. He literally had Even said this and some they were just trying to buy time for their coup. That was the exactly whole point. Because Trump, yes, exactly because Trump believed that there was actual fraud in the election. He wanted more time to be able to find the proof of yes, that fraud. Yes, I agree. You're justifying and the it, insurrection. And, he wanted to coup the government true. because he thought they no, stole it from that's him. proof that it's not an insurrection. He knew it was going to end up at the Supreme Court. Had Mike Pence... You keep trying to invent false histories. No, you're, you're giving you like a mens rea for insurrection. He the thought the election was stolen, therefore he could try to flip the, the election. The mens rea is vital in every single criminal prosecution. If you don't have mens rea, you don't have a crime. That's literally the, not true because strict Trump's liability crimes can be convicted with no mens rea. Have, but yes, okay. Unless you have, which are the tiny minority of prosecutions. Sure, that's but fine. But mens rea is what, not, uh, uh, just because you didn't know you're doing an insurrection there, doesn't there, save you from the act, the fact of the matter of it being an insurrection and you being held to account for every single thing related to it. These are empty arguments. This is just insane. well. I, we'll see when it goes to court. I guess Trump didn't know that it was an insurrection. Wait, so wait, wait, Glenn, the, I, yeah. I think we've gone around quite a bit. We've probably gone everything. What time do you want to finish? Because it's been around I two mean, hours. Honestly, unless there's like we 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 haven't discussed the issue of like what the FBI role is. Although we did talk about the fact that the FBI had informants on the ground. I don't really need to go into Ray Apps, a thing I've never really been a fan of. I do think there's a question about why the FBI didn't know more or if they did know more, but I feel like we debated that a lot in the first debate, which was three plus hours. I feel like we're kind of at the end of the discussion. It's been just a little over two hours, so I'm fine in ending it here unless Destiny feels like there's some really pressing issue that we haven't covered. Uh, no, I think this is, what do, you, what do you think about the whole elector scheme? I think Trump believed that there was an actual good faith reason to believe that there was fraud committed in the election. And he was told that if you submit various electors that would buy them the time to find the proof that they hadn't yet found. So you think that as long as Trump thought there was fraud, he was authorized to do basically whatever he wanted as long as he could find a lawyer that agreed with him? No, I believe that that entitled him to exhaust every legal recourse in the other two branches of government, which is what he actually did. And once those recourses were exhausted and he lost them all, as he did, he w his obligation was to do what he did, which was to walk peacefully out of the White House on January 20th as part of the peaceful transition of power to Joe Biden. Do you think the fake electors were that's legal? Having history. people testify to being electors when they're not, you think that's... You think that's okay because he thought that maybe the, there was election fraud? He could have those people lie about being the duly elected electors or appointed electors? I mean, I don't, I contest that characterization, but I also think that Which, it would have been part of that? what would have been, that it would have been part of what would have been contested as part of the judiciary. All of this would have ended up in the courts. You want to create this false history about how if Mike Pence had done something that he didn't actually do, what Trump would have done. My belief is that Trump would have left the White House on January 20th, no matter how many other proceedings he ended up resorting to. There was the Supreme Court there, even though people were claiming that Amy Coney Barrett had only gotten this position because of a promise that I'm she made to vote that, for yeah. Donald Trump in the election. None of that ever happened. In the real history, in the actual history, once Trump lost everything that he tried in the legal process, he left office peacefully. And that is if the he fact delayed, that I believe that okay. everything you say sure. will never change. Gotcha. So if he would have managed to delay the certification of the vote by, let's say, a month because a Supreme Court case, they wanted to wait for whatever reason. And then they do the electoral investigation. They find out there's no fraud. And then he leaves peacefully after staying in office longer than he should have for a few weeks. Would that have been okay? I mean, we, we're just, again, you're trying to create, to create false histories. If, That's literally what, that what he was trying to do. If Trump convinced the Congress, if Trump convinced the Congress, that there was sufficient evidence of fraud that a month was required to investigate the evidence of fraud that Congress believed had there, and they wanted to set, delay it by a month, and then Congress went back and certified the actual results of the election, and then Trump left peacefully on January 20th, my view would be the same. As long as Trump confined himself to appealing to the other two branches of government and did not try and use his command of the military or his command of the other armed parts of the, of the government to keep himself in power, words like coup and insurrection are things that only MSNBC fans get excited about and believe. And I think it's the reason why Trump is leading in all the polls, because people obviously don't think that what Trump did 
did rose to a level of criminality even to keep him out of the White House, much less to put himself in jail. And then when Trump told his Justice Department, when he told Clark to go and talk to, I think it was the acting uh, AG Rosen and then the acting deputy uh, AG Donahue, that you guys need to write a letter to the state saying we have all this evidence of election fraud and that if they refused, uh, Clark told Rosen that he'd basically be fired and he'd be made acting attorney general. And when that same scheme was brought up in the Oval Office, and I think half of the uh, White House staff threatened to quit if Trump went through with it, do you think that any of that was improper? Asking his uh, Department of Justice to lie to the states about election fraud? It if you believe, as I do, that Trump's contention that the 2020 election was pervaded with all sorts of fraud and that he was the legitimate winner of the 2020 election, asking his Justice Department to find that evidence and telling them that he would fire them if they refused looks a lot different in its intent than if you begin with the assumption that you are beginning in that Trump knew that he lost and that everything he was trying to do was an attempt illegally to stay in power. And as I've told you many times, that narrative that Trump was willing to do anything, even outside the law, as long as he could stay in power, is completely contradicted by not only the things that he did do, but by more importantly, the things that he didn't do. And that you can try and create every alternative history that you want. It's very difficult to analyze hypotheticals like that where we don't have any context or any details for what happened. I can look at the events that happened in real life and those culminated with Donald Trump not calling in the military, not trying to rile up the armed factions of the government as he could have done. Certainly a lot of them would have been loyal to him. He could have caused a lot of violence, a lot of internal conflict, maybe even a civil war in order to stay in power. He did none of that and he transferred power peacefully to Joe Biden in the way that has been done since do you the think, beginning of the Do you Republic. think Donald Trump, does he bear any responsibility at all for what happened on January 6th? I mean, he has responsibility, but not in a way that could ever be legal. I mean, he clearly riled up that crowd. He got people riled up. I mean, Rachel Maddow and Bernie Sanders once riled up one of their fans. I'm not so asking about Maddow or Bernie Sanders. I know we no, like to pivot. I, I'm no, saying, do you think Trump at all, does he have any no, culpability? No, I'm gonna, the reason I'm going to bring up analogies, even though you interrupt me and tell me that I shouldn't, well, is it's because, because you don't want to actually say something not, bad about Trump. Because, it, because you need to be partisan. Tests whether or not, it tests whether or not you actually have any consistency. I have all the consistency in the world. Wait, 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 so Glenn, you meant, Glenn, you meant that. Glenn, you mentioned I, that. I, I think, I think uh, if, 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 if he's going to keep, if he wants to prolong this by asking me questions, I'm going to insist on the uh, right to answer the questions in the way that I actually want. And if that means bringing up analogies or metaphors. Sure. Or yeah, well, here, I can help with the analogies. The if anybody else did then, the same thing that Trump did on J6, I'd say it's an insurrection. I'm only going to say, we're kind of like at the point where it's an interrogation. I'm kind of am flattered that destiny seems not to want to end. So he's just kind of now asking me a bunch of questions, which I'm happy to engage in for a little bit longer, provided that I'm able to answer the questions okay. without constantly being interrupted. All right. The a lot of people have inspired other people to commit crimes. Rachel Maddow and Bernie Sanders, as I said, once got a Democrat, a liberal fan of theirs, so riled up in the belief that the Republicans were fascist and in bed with the Kremlin, that one of them actually went in their names and shot up Republican congressmen to try and kill as many of them as he could and almost killed Steve Scalise. So if you were to ask me, did Donald, did Rachel Maddow and Bernie Sanders do anything to cause that person to go and do that, I would say yes, but not in a way that they bore any blame. They got people riled up, and sometimes if you get people riled up, some of them are going to go and commit crimes. The Supreme Court has said you can never be held liable for what other people do as a result of being inspired by your speech. So yeah, if you go around and constantly claim that the election results were the byproduct of fraud, I think it's predictable that some people might engage in violence. It's the kind of thing that you might even think, if it really happened, violence might even be justified. But I don't think that Donald Trump did anything illegal or anything that, be, that could be prosecuted, which is why, again, Jack Smith did not charge him with inciting an insurrection, because there's nothing in what Trump said that was anything other than constitutionally protected. Well, it's a and destiny. That, I, think, yeah. I think what Glenn said is really what lies at your whole basis of the argument mm -hmm. was that Trump did not tell them exactly to go into the Capitol. But like what Glenn said is he heated up the crowds, uh, he did heat up the crowd and he did talk about false selection, which did incite them, although he didn't actually tell them to do that. That's what Glenn... He told them to you to go peacefully. That's what he told them. He, he also told, said to he, fight like how they're stealing your country. But, but wait a second, Glenn, did he not just say he, he heated up the crowd? Yeah, he heated up the crowd because... 
a lot of crowds get, you're, you're allowed to heat up crowds. I've heated yeah. up crowds before by saying, oh, look, the NSA is spying on you in a way that's unconstitutional. Now, maybe some of those people might have been motivated to go to the NSA and try and plant a bomb because I heated them up. But it wouldn't mean that I was responsible. The only thing that Trump said about violence and whether it should be used on January 6th was, don't do it. Go to the Capitol and be peaceful. Obviously, they were agitated and riled up as a result of a political speech. That's what you want to do in a political speech. You want to agitate people and get them riled up about an injustice that you're there to speak about. That's what every good political speech does. Do you, one final question. I'm so curious on this. For Trump legitimately thinking that there was voter fraud, legitimately thinking that the election was stolen. So despite the fact that his, uh, all of his campaign people, I think Bill Stepien is uh, field director, um, despite, despite the fact that uh, Chris Miller from an intelligence agency, despite the fact that William Barr, his attorney general, despite the fact that all of these people that he trusted in his government, I think Pence and his team looked into it, everybody that he trusted to look into election fraud, they all said that it wasn't there, and he still said it was there. What would it take for you to be convinced that Donald Trump was knowingly repeating false claims about the election and he was only repeating them so that he could stay in power. What would you need well, to actually well, prove well, his state of, of all, mind there? You, first of all, you were the one who said earlier that the reason why Trump didn't order the military, the intelligence community to act to protect him is because they were essentially trying to subvert him. You even said that he was basically alone, that no one was on his side in the government, that even the people surrounding him in the military intelligence community didn't actually trust him. So I'm not surprised that he didn't find those arguments or their conclusions persuasive because he understood that a lot of people in government were there to subvert him. But as Darren Beatty said to you, who worked in the Trump White House and knows a lot of people who knows Trump well and who himself knows Trump well, I don't think there's a single person who knows Trump well who doubts that Trump actually believed that there was fraud in the election. Now maybe that's because he's so psychologically invested in his ego that he actually can't believe that he would have actually lost an election. Maybe it's because he had really become convinced that the entire American establishment was so corruptly aligned against him and willing to do anything and everything to remove him from power. Maybe it's because Democrats have cheated before in elections, like I said, in 1960. There's probably other times as well. Because they I don't cheated really in 1960, you, the Hawaii thing? There, there's, I mean, I wasn't around then, but the, there's a lot of historians who believe that the Daily Machine in Chicago, oh, the Chicago got part. John Kennedy the election in Illinois. I sure. mean, I'm not saying I believe that, but that is something if, that. Let's a say lot that what you're saying is true believe. that that he didn't trust any of these people. Wasn't the reason why he didn't trust them because he asked them to find election fraud and they said no? Doesn't that show no, that he had, he, he had started to trusting them previously? There were people close to him. Then why did he trust them to investigate election fraud? Who were telling him that they had proof that there was fraud in the election? There were a lot of people who were making that argument both publicly and privately to him. But without any and evidence, if you know anything about Donald Trump? that his inability to believe that he actually lost, that the American people had actually rejected him, and that the Democrats and the US security state and the deep state, something he had spent years complaining about, and that you yourself even said were in fact aligned against him, the fact that Donald Trump would actually, under those circumstances, come to conclude that he didn't really lose, but in fact was the victim of fraud, is something that is very easy for me to believe was true. And, and I think what Darren Beatty said is right on that almost every person who knows Trump that I've ever talked to, even ones who believe that the election fraud claims are bullshit, were convinced that he was authentic in his belief that that election so was what, 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 what evidence would it take to show you otherwise, to convince you otherwise? I mean, ultimately, there's no proof one way or the other about what's going on in somebody's brain. All we can use is circumstantial evidence. Correct. So I'm asking what circumstantial evidence, so, yes. Yeah, I think that the fact that there were people telling him in his ear that he did not actually lose the election, the way in which he psychologically constituted, the way that he has talked so many times about both the Democratic Party and the U.S. establishment, the fact that he maintains to this very day that the election was stolen, even though that a majority of Americans don't actually agree with him on this, the lengths to which he went, the way in which he argues it, the fact that a lot of people believe in the Republican Party, in fact, I think a majority, that there was actually election fraud, all to me point to the fact that when you put that together with Trump's psychological incentives to believe that he didn't really lose, it's far more likely than not that he truly was convinced that there was sufficient fraud in the election that made him the legitimate winner. So there's no piece of evidence, because everything you're saying is also consistent with him just wanting to there's stay in no power. There's no such thing as dispositive proof when it comes to understanding what's in somebody's brain. Okay, it's I don't know why you keep saying that. How do, we get, how do we get convictions where mens rea 
is an essential part of the crime. Like for first degree murder, yeah, that, we have to know that you intended to murder somebody. It was just manslaughter, right, Glenn? We read people's states you, of mind you, all the time for criminal you, court. You, 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 I'm realizing now that you don't understand the difference between evidence and proof. Proof is something that is dispositive. So if someone steals something and they're caught on a videotape stealing it, then you have dispositive proof that they've done so. Usually in criminal cases, there's not proof, there's evidence. And the evidence is often conflicting and a jury has to decide how to resolve that conflicting evidence. And that's why in a civil trial, they're told they have to believe just 51% or more sure. in order to reach a verdict, whereas in a criminal trial, they have to believe beyond all reasonable doubt. But the way that works is you present evidence of intent. There's very rarely proof of intent. Sure, which I'm is sorry. The thing that you're looking when for. I'm asking you, don't you for- either. When I'm, You don't have it either. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you, you're uh, right. You, you cannot prove one hundred percent. That's true. Exactly. What I'm asking exactly. is, what is the types of evidence that would move you over into thinking, oh, he was probably just trying to hold on to power? Oh, and actually, yeah. I think I did say evidence, by the way. But what is the evidence that would convince you that, oh, you know, there's not one piece of dispositive thing, not a written confession or a had, travel if, to if, the past? If Trump, if Trump had said to people who convincingly relate it, oh, you know what? I actually think I really lost this. So you need a confession. No way I'm going to let my my no, you're asking me for examples of things that I would find convincing, and I'm giving those to you. Besides I, a confession, I, I, obviously. Well, th that's one good way. Another good way is if he had nobody around him who was believing or arguing that there was evidence of fraud, that he was just kind of, as you were trying to claim I was, on an island all by myself, if he had actually nobody that he was around him or that he trusted telling him that there was proof of fraud or strong evidence of fraud, even though you had Rudy Giuliani and other people telling him that they strongly believed there was, I think that would add to the belief, to the credible case, that Trump was saying there was fraud even though he really didn't believe it. None of those things actually happened though. None of those things is true. And so you're asking me to say what my belief is based on the body of evidence that I have, all of which I've described for you and laid out in great detail over the last five minutes, that leads me to believe well, very no. strongly while recognizing no. there's no proof that Trump believed the election was fraudulent. Mm -hmm. So to be that's clear, it, can you just do your final point here? Because I feel like we're just going Yeah, that's fine. I'm good. I, I'll yeah, just I'll respond to that final point. I don't have any more questions. To be clear, yeah. you haven't laid out any strong evidence showing that Donald Trump sincerely okay, believes other the than this idea. You need to declare yourself other than this idea. I'm not declaring something. Other than this idea that just Trump has this. Side. That Just Trump has this psychotic attention. You the American voters are going to decide. The Supreme Court is going to decide. All sorts of people are going to be deciding. A whole bunch of things. But this idea. No, we should participate in a debate. But this need that you have to constantly say, "I'm on an island. Nobody agrees with me. You're right. I have no evidence." Just let people have watched the debate. They can if do it. But I think it's evidence, important to call out. People understand that you have not I think laid you have no out any well. factually compelling any arguments. That. Nothing that you say you is factual. Okay, well, I have. Okay. I, I can think... point to exact things. For instance, that Raffensperger call that you brought up earlier. We're going to be looking for eleven thousand votes. You. Not, I know you don't I'm want to debate very, on the facts. I'm, you want to talk about I'm the fact that they're I'm partisan and the courts were Democrats. For, got, and Pelosi no, was the first one to put together a partisan body. This is not no. interesting. Wait, wait, yeah, I, I, I'm very, I'm about Thanks, this. Glenn. Go ahead. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Destiny, thank, I think that's the best time to finish off. Uh, thanks both for responding. Actually, it was around, around, around half an hour ago. I think it was actually around 34 minutes ago. I wrote down the time because you actually both agreed with each other. So I was very proud of that moment 34 minutes ago. Uh, but aside from that, I think overall it was, it, was, it was good debate. It was some heated moments and thank you both for joining. Yeah, thanks Destiny for doing it. Thank you Eli for moderating and did a great job. No, thanks thank you. No, yep. no problem. Thanks so All much. All right, good night. Good night. <laughs>
Or it's like the total lies. Like, well, we saw the videos. Yeah, we did see the videos. There were videos of thousands of screaming people outside fighting with Metropolitan Police that were breaking down doors and windows, that were barging their way into offices, that were screaming and shouting and throwing things and attacking people and fight. Like, we saw the videos, yes. Did you also see a few videos of police like moving people around inside the Capitol once they're in? Yeah, sure. What's the implication by bringing that up, that they were let in? We all know that's not the case. Even he admitted that, um, even he admitted that the first people in broke in. Um, yeah. The, uh, yeah, him bringing up that Hawaii thing. I'm actually more upset that he knew what that was. I I was hoping that he would just say, ah, uh, well, you know, blah, blah, and I, then I could explain it. The fact that he knew what it was, um, the fact that he knew what that was and was able to fully explain it and still brought it up as an example, mm, that was slimy as fuck. Um, yeah. Ugh. What a stupid conversation. And then the constant pivoting of whataboutism to BLM. And then this claim that like Giuliani was a great, amazing litigator and lawyer and he'd been working with Eastman for so long and Sidney Powell is such an amazing lawyer and all like, ugh. It wasn't thousands, <laughs> it was 2000. <laughs> where is, um, uh, where is uh, August? That needs to be the, that has to be the clip. That has to be interesting. It wasn't thousands. It was two thousands, okay? Saying that Fort Sumter wasn't an insurrection. It only happened because of the civil war that came after. Uh, he left, so how could it have been a coup? Um, holy Christ. When he brought up, like, I thought we were talking about a coup the whole time. We literally started with insurrection. Ugh. My brother. Hi. I just want to say, first of all, congratulations. That was absolute, in my opinion. And I know that, listen, we have a lot of fights, you and me, a lot of debates. In my opinion, that was complete domination. Yeah. When he said that the attack on Fort Sumter is only considered an insurrection in retrospect, that is the one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard in my life. It is unhinged everyone understood the attack on fort sumter to be an insurrection um, and for him at the time not retroactively um and for him to have the temerity to claim that it's only in hindsight that we realize it and not even give you straight answers on anything you, yeah yeah the pivoting on everything was so stupid too horrendous the when you ask him straight up what would it take you to convince you that he didn't have the state of mind of being actually convinced of the fraud. He knows what you're asking, right? He's just trying to buy time. What he's asking is like, what, what would it take for you to convince you had to- Oh yeah, what's, well, what, you're saying what's the dispositive oh, video that evidence? would- It's like, bro, come on. Yeah. Dude, shut up. Everyone knows what Steven is asking in that moment. And the truth is that anything short of a confession, Yeah. Any, you would not accept it. Always, and, yeah. and it's it's the proof is in the pudding. Uh, what what world are we creating yeah. where only written confessions would be proof of evidence? He would never. And he knows ever that. He absolutely that. knows he, that. He and yeah, you're right because he wouldn't apply that standard. Yeah, he of course. He would never yeah. apply that to the FBI. Yeah. You know, he, this is the people who are like. Um, imagine if you were to say like, well, Hillary Clinton never admitted to being corrupt. You're like, of course you're not going to admit it. Right, he would say that yeah. in a second. I also wanted to. I didn't want to. I don't want to delay anymore. But I thought there was one more really good gotcha question because at the end I asked him why didn't he trust any of the people around him to uh, tell him if there was election fraud. And he said, "Well, you know, you said it. They didn't trust. He didn't trust any of those people." I think the natural next question would have been, "Well, then why do you think he would have asked them to do a military coup if yes. he didn't even trust them for yeah. election fraud? Why the f he asked them to do a military coup?" But I want to. Yeah. Ugh. That, yeah, like he's was try he was trying to live in both worlds at the same time. Like, yes, well, you said he wouldn't yes. ask because of this. And then he was like, oh, well, he should have asked them if that was like, it was like, okay, dude, yeah, dumb. And one of the reasons he was breaking with his people was precisely because of this issue, because they weren't supporting him on it. So one of the reasons why on the day of January 6th, he's not going to like risk everything and be a complete sort of reckless person as yeah. opposed to just himself sitting and watching chaos unfold is precisely because they weren't going along yeah. with his previous efforts. Which also that goes into, and I don't know, 
how to prove this, if I start like looking up timelines of every hire, one thing that I don't like, and, and Glenn presented it, there are so many other things I could have said, obviously, but he wanted to talk a lot and it would have been me rambling and blah, blah, blah. But I don't like this perception. Here's the perception that people have. The perception that people have is that Donald Trump has a collection of legal figures and you know a few of them said that the election fraud and the elector scheme was a bad idea and a few of them said actually it was a pretty good idea. It would have worked. Um, and those few people, uh, you know, Powell, uh, Pal Giuliani and Eastman, you know, these are people who work for a long time, you trust him. That is not true. He lawyer shopped so hard for dog shit opinions and every single fucking person that was his counsel and legal team complained about it, that he would constantly go to other people if he wasn't getting the answers that he wanted to. It's why he switched out so much legal representation. He's finally settled on these three lunatics it's because he's constantly looking for people that will be really co-conspirators um th but they will people that will give him the legal answers or theories that he wants or needs to concoct whatever bullshit he wants to have to do whatever actually and, wants, and yeah. the, the defensive count that uh, he was time man of the year i can't believe those I words that, that was he's, he's, mouth. he said he said rudy giuliani. giuliani was time man of the yeah, year not for his prowess well i mean i guess he did the rico shit or whatever but like that was for what the 9 11 uh, America's mayor bullshit. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, and it doesn't fucking matter. Taylor doesn't Swift matter. was Time Woman of the Year last year. I, I wouldn't people want Joe Biden to go to her for people degenerate yeah. mentally and physically. Yeah. Um, it, it's so absurd. The, the defense of counsel or, or advice of counsel defense is premised on like good faith. Yeah, that's like the whole the whole notion of it. And but, but typically, uh, ignorance of the law is not a defense in most cases yeah and his his in, uh, argument is an invitation to chaos we're like i, I guess if as long as i can memo, find a lawyer to say me yeah, yeah. what a wildly uh, stupid but like the problem is like insane. to engage in that argument i think you they have to be operating in good faith to some extent because he's always going to be able to like give me these weird well actually responses and again, but like he yeah. would never apply that to the security state apparatus sure he would never say well as long as the cia has a good faith belief that mm -hmm. um this surveillance thing could be potentially legal and yeah. they have a memo the, because they have no okay. problem mind reading with 100% accuracy everybody involved Watch in the FBI percent. investigation everybody Watch involved in the Hillary Clinton Hillary stuff Clinton. everybody yeah. involved yeah they'll mind read 100% oh and I know you saw how that yeah. little worm squirmed he squirmed when you asked him to criticize Trump at all yeah. you remember that it took like four well I mean a lot of people uh, well, it was no, like no, no, what do I think about Bernie. Trump yeah let Bernie. me tell you about Rachel Maddow and Bernie Sanders first <laughs> it was like bro what the fuck because he's oh his God. audience. He, he can't criticize he has to daddy. signal. Yeah. He can't criticize daddy. And that, that's that's what's going on here. Um, and uh, honestly, if, if get him on the record saying, I think it's abhorrent, this Eastman theory. I think it's condemnable what Trump was doing. Uh, and obviously, he was uh, extremely reckless. I condemn him on the lack of time or the, the time lag. If he were saying those things and being mm -hmm. strong and saying, I just don't think it rises to this level, okay, maybe you can have an argument of good faith. Sure. But when you are going out of your way to not criticize him on areas where you're not even fighting on the merits, yeah. it, 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 to me, there's just there's no good faith. Yeah, for 100%, yeah. Yeah, because you're right. There could be a limited good faith exception. Like, well, maybe he thought this or blah, 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 blah. But when he's saying like, well, Trump maybe thought he lost the election, therefore he can pursue whatever cockamamie f***ing act he wants to after, even if it involves staying in office a little bit longer or delaying the vote a little bit, as long as he eventually you know, leaves peacefully. Yeah. Like, what a yeah. wild statement. Yeah, Jesus. Oh, oh, yeah, him oh, constantly yeah. appealing to the fact that Trump walked out he peacefully walked out. on yeah. specific day is, <laughs> on such, the 20th. is so fucking stupid. My so what God. happens if he ordered a military strike on the Capitol on the 19th? On the 19th. Say, well, he yeah, saved exactly. himself because he said as long as he didn't use the military, right? Yeah. No, but, but that's such a, a preposterous carbon standard. I know. He's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anything military is automatically, uh, well, I don't know. Th that's the thing where he can't have a good faith anymore. So if he had a good faith belief that military were legal to use to subvert the election, why wouldn't that count? What's the limiting principle that says, well, if Eastman writes it in a memo, it's not acceptable. It's utter horseshit. Yeah. It's a standard that only applies for Trump and I the also, that they like. I really liked the whole, um, I really liked the whole, uh, we know exactly what Trump was trying to do when he said go peacefully and we ignore the entire extra context of that speech. We ignore everything that actually happened afterwards. But then I was like, okay, well, what about when he said to uh, Pence, you know, like, you're oh, too well, true. You don't really know. Well, I mean, who knows what he meant by that? No, line. Like, no, no, oh no. my he God, had the bro, long bro, pause come first. on. He yeah. had the world's longest pause first. And that's why when you said August should make the first clip about what thousands mean, I think it should be back to back because when you had him on that, it was the world's fucking longest pause. Well, I don't know exactly what, my you know, God. you're too honest, Mike. Yeah.
Mm. It was it, it's very it was very convenient, very convenient when he had lapsed the memory. I don't know what the insurrection, or the whiskey rebellion is. I don't know what this yeah. is. I know I, who can tell, but I know for certain when he has one line in there that's like self, uh, you know, bolstering. Then I'm going to credit that to the, to the nth degree. Like like he would ever give that sympathy to anyone he was against. Yeah. Like he remember you know he always says I speak truth to power. I'm a real journalist. Come off it. Come off it. We were talking about the most powerful man in the world at that time, mm -hmm. and you're not going to speak truth about it. You're, you're going to grant him every single possible 50-50 uh, call. It's utter uh, Yeah, and you're being generous saying 50-50 call there. But yeah. yeah. Did you catch sure. something Weasley? Well, he did multiple Weasley things, obviously. So but many one, one of the ones that, stuck, that oh, wait. jumped out. One of the, the ones end. that, hold on, and I have like this one. Out. I'm sorry. I, I knew yeah. this coming in, but I didn't know if something had changed in like the past two weeks, and I didn't want to get like something factual. Like, to be clear, Johnson has not released all the videos from the Capitol, no. right? That it's has not, not no. happened, yeah. right? Okay. Because I've seen that before because they claimed it earlier. And my understanding is he released like less than 1%, whatever basically I think they gave to Carlson and maybe a little bit more, but they have not released all that footage. Or if they have, I haven't seen the link anywhere. I haven't seen that hosted anywhere. So, and also, and also, if McCarthy and Johnson were really interested in like good faith releasing, why did McCarthy only release select footage? Not just select footage, but to one specific person in the media rather than the media collectively. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why not make it available to everybody? Put it on a server and let's all go through it, right? I, I, and your point was so good. Your, your point was so good, which is like, what are you trying to prove here, Glenn? We're trying to prove here. So, so what did you want the comps to do at that moment when, yeah. when the capital's already been breached? They're in damage control mode. And, you know, you know, cats out of the what's what's the phrase? Horse that's out of the barn. I don't, I don't know what the phrase is, but whatever the phrase is, that's what's going on. Did you want them to engage in CQC against what? These thousands of people. Sorry, thousand yeah. plus people. Uh, no, it'd be, but then his answers were because I asked he's, why he brought that up, and he's like, "Well, it yeah. demonstrates that it wasn't that series of events, and the ma vast majority of them, you know, didn't have a premeditated plan, and only a small percentage." Were, it's always repeating. It's always like the same, like four or five bullshit lines, right? Trump did the peaceful meme. Uh, the people there, you know, left after only three hours. Uh, not that many people died. Uh, nothing actually happened, uh, and um, only a small percentage of them were actually violent. And yeah, it's like always like the same bullshit, like nothing that addresses that. It's all non sequitur bullshit. Yeah. When people watch the VOD, I want them to stop at a very particular point where you ask uh, what you think the mindset would be of someone who didn't call the uh, National Guard or Marshall Federal Services right away to try to address it. He said, I think that Trump thought it was legitimate that he agreed with yes, it, even though they had yeah. breached. He said those words. So he admitted that in his own words, his own interpretation of events, he thinks Trump absolutely agreed with what was going on. That's mm -hmm. Glenn's position that he admitted. And he said that, that, that that's what Trump's made state of mind in his own vision. Mm -hmm. and. Everyone agrees that Trump was aware there was violence at the time. That ends any question yeah, it, it, of yeah. Rea, Babbitt was of, dead, of and the note was on his desk, and he didn't do anything. Uh, you know, for until I, was it an hour after Babbitt died that he finally made that last tweet or whatever? Um, yeah, it just. It, but oh it, my God, he admitted it. No, it, it, I mean, like it literally is. I, my mouth was agape I, I, when, he, when he did that because he is literally admitting and someone can correct me if I'm wrong he said uh, he thought it was legitimate so he agreed with it I think those were the exact words he used or something to that effect um, and that is just a absolute confession in my mind that well that's yeah because that's what it always is is despite how much yeah. they wiggle and squirm and they should just fucking own it just say it like yeah fuck it you motherfuckers stole the election so of course we were going to show up to fight like hell to protect our fucking democracy just say it just say that instead of this weird like half cuck position where you don't even own what you're actually trying to do which is like the most pathetic the thing charging about. position every single time and you characterized it correctly when you're like all these bullshit points that don't mean anything when he first you, you he's like well how many people died there you know the only one person cares? died well, yeah. You're like, well, you bring up Fort Sumner. He's like, well, only one person died there, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, it's, I guess it's not about death. It's about likelihood to achieve aims. To succeed, okay. yeah. Oh, Whiskey Rebellion, oh, I guess I don't know, really know anything about that. Well, what about the Civil War itself, you know? Or in my hypothetical, I can't consider any hypothetical. It, and, and then uh, the other situations were um, when you were bringing up convictions, right? He was like, well, I know why Jack Smith didn't, didn't go for convictions here, or didn't, or sorry, uh, didn't go for criminal charges. And you bring up, well, they didn't charge Civil War people. Yeah. Oh, and that, that, by the way, is like, I think that's 100% dispositive then that Trump didn't commit a crime that, or didn't commit that because one guy shows well, how it's, to it's charge him with it. It's like, not dispositive, but, yeah. but it's, it shows me like, uh, yeah. so now I'm taking my cues from the DOJ when I need it. Yeah. When, I, when I'm taking, when the DOJ- But I'm sure that when you ask him, well, do you that, think they overcharged all of the people uh, for the Gen 6 stuff? Well, now, you know, now he's going to say, no, well, the entire DOJ was corrupt. Now it's all overreach. Now it's all insanity. Does that mean, yeah. that, does that, mean that Hillary Clinton was innocent? The fact that the DOJ chose not to prosecute her? Would he ever bite that Which is so stupid. Hold on. Fuck. That's even more dumb 
because I bet even for the convictions, he thinks they're stupid. I should have just asked him, okay, wait, so if Jack Smith charged with insurrection, would that convince you one way or another at all? Would it point you in oh, any direction? 100%. He would say no, absolutely yeah. not. Even if he was convicted of insurrection, I don't yeah. think it would change his mind. So what a stupid point. A thousand percent. Oh, yeah, dumb. Weasley thing he did at the end was at one point, Stephen, he, you said that, uh, like he asked you, okay, why didn't Trump deploy the military? And you gave off a litany of good reasons, one of which is, okay, number one, the military is an obligation to disregard unlawful orders, number one. Number two, Donald Trump probably believed or could have believed that the military didn't have his back given his beef with Mark Milley and everything. Yeah. So then later on, Greenwald accused you of making that argument. He said, well, you just argued that, you know, the military wouldn't have had Trump's back. When you were saying that was Trump's perspective, like he was trying to associate you with arguments mm -hmm. yes, that, yeah, yeah. Like it, that you did not make. And he was doing it when it was convenient there at the end. Sure. I thought you said, Destiny, I thought you said that uh, the military wouldn't have had Trump's back. So there was no chance of a coup being successful in the first place. Just it's so gross. Yeah. Gross. He's honor bound. They're honor bound to follow. Yeah, they have to. Yeah, 100%. There is no evidence or anything that could come out ever that would show one way or another that they would actually convince them of Donald Trump was probably didn't think the election was stolen. Was just trying to and, and any sort of a confession. Him. I mean, but but that standard is a um, ad hoc standard. It's a it's standard. It's ahistorical. Exactly it's not legally it's accepted. Yeah. We can convict literally on states of mind beyond a reasonable doubt in U.S. criminal court. So it's 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 a it's a bullshit standard. It's ridiculous. And it's an if you wanted to be like standard. if you wanted to be really prickly, technically, I don't even know if confessions are necessarily good proof of that because there are so many other ways that a confession could be procured that would be stupid that where we would toss it out where we like like there's like yeah even that's not a good standard technically. Say so. it was given under duress and that Trump says shit. Yeah, you know, he contradicts himself all exactly, the time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Himself well, because he already said that here, because Trump might have said yeah. that to somebody else. He's like, well, come on, Trump was just talking shit, you know, like he didn't actually. Oh, believe yeah. This, you I know, mean, like right, when, when he said when he's talking to Pence, dictator, right? Or, or, yeah. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. When he's talking to Pence, he didn't mean that. You, you're too, yeah. you know. Yeah. Dumb. Yeah. But we don't know what he meant by that when he said Pence exactly too honest. And we and we don't know if that was faithfully conveyed. I think that was the other thing that he said, like, do, do we really trust? Um, do we really trust that evidence? Uh, the fact that we don't have like a recording of Mike Pence and Donald Trump saying these things, which actually, I mean, I don't know, because obviously the, the, the trials hasn't even started yet. So there's no telling what evidence may come out. They're still yeah. investigating it. But there, it's I don't know. I was I was really disappointed that he wouldn't answer a straight question on. Of course. Pretty much well, because they can, I mean, because this is like one of those things where when you like dig more into it, it's like. I feel like the answer is so obvious. Like when your go-to is, hold on, Destiny, you said that if two people were at the Capitol, that that wouldn't be an insert. Like, bro, that no, I no, wouldn't, absolutely not, no. The reason why I, no, or go ahead. The reason I bite, if two people are planning an assassination of a major political, uh, let's say the President of the United States, to make it as major as possible, they're planning the assassination of the President of the United States, more than one person, right? And they succeed in that, I, for the purpose of obstructing some U.S. law, let's say that you're you're trying to kill the president in order to prevent passage or signing of some. Yeah, law, I, right? I agree. I agree that, that there I is would, an argument that could be made, but I would have yeah. to qualify it so much, and he's just going to scream over and again. You think two people would be an insurrection? What about when these two people and BLM said this? Or what about like I, I would say the whole argument would go in that direction. So I was like, fuck it. But the burden was always on you, even though he wasn't agnostic on the position. So like you were the one who had to come up with like either a definitive number or a ballpark number for what constituted an insurrection, like the number of people involved. Glenn, it'd be one thing if Glenn took the position, listen, I'm not sure if it's an insurrection. Uh, I'm, I'm open to persuasion, but I'm not convinced. Uh, therefore, when you flip the question on him, okay, well, how many people would need to be involved? Then he would be justified to say, I don't know. But instead, he makes a positive claim. Like, he says a definitive claim. This was not an insurrection. He laughs at the notion. But even he can't answer the fucking question. He can't point a single insurrection in American history None. other than the Civil War. Right. Other yeah. than Civil War, I mean, that would be the easiest thing to that. do is to cite something like, no, 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 in American history, it's not just the Civil War. It's this, 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 and this, and this isn't fit because of these who, By the way, who also, at the, the start, they also thought they were in the legal right, by the way. They they had they had legal memos that, saying that point. they could secede from yes, the yes, union. Yes. You know? yeah, that's stupid, a key yeah. point. I mean, this is the yeah. same point that good logic was making in the debate in the kick, kick or keep, yeah. where he's like, well, they thought, they, they, they knew they were breaking the law. No, they had arguments for what, and, and they had theories that they believe that they actually genuinely believed yeah. that this was a hundred percent legal a, a, a trillion percent legal and we there's no good faith exception to insurrection it's a ridiculous concept mm -hmm. um it's it just not in the historical record that that's a part of the definition yeah. just like number of lives lost or likelihood of success there's no in, the, the historical part of it was the absolute worst thing that glenn yeah 
as said. I think Which I like, would, if like, we would have gone into the Fourteenth Amendment thing, that stuff would have started to come up way more. But because, oh yeah, because yeah, it is annoying that he's using insurrection in like a hyper specific way. That, like you said, it would literally nothing that's happened. For well, I mean, he said Fort Sumter wasn't an insurrection. <laughs> I mean, like uh, literally uh, nothing uh, is an insurrection. I guess yes. at that point, yeah. There's no, there if is you no. You can't say yeah. that Fort Sumter at the time of Fort Sumter. You don't have to invent a crazy hypothetical. Just Fort Sumter at the time of Fort Sumter was. If you're not able to give a straight answer that that was an insurrection, you are at fucking C. That is yeah. the initiation of the civil war the insurrection act was invoked right after by lincoln yeah but that was because lincoln knew pisco yeah. lincoln was psychic you could see the future. he knew what was going to happen man, he yeah. knew everything it is so fucking stupid also the mental state of lincoln um at that moment right like if you're not going to credit his labeling of it as an insurrection at the time but you are going to credit his i don't know his prophecy ability i don't it's so it's so stupid and you caught him on it and he you could tell when he's like i don't want to rehash all the history stuff it's there yeah. you got it yeah because he started to realize very quickly no myself. at all history it was just the headline shit um the, the hawaii and chicago and yeah it was just all like the typical headline shit yeah embarrassing yeah uh, criticisms uh, i have criticisms yeah go the only i think overall you did an extremely good job um i still think you're and i think this is fundamentally because you want to make it seem and you you have a a goal of being responsive mm -hmm. and i and i think that's generally good and i think that you do a good job of oh that i let him lead me around too much you're too reactive a little bit too reactive so yeah like, so i understand i understand what you're saying there 100 percent. this is the only and i'm I'll, maybe i'll think about this more to figure out how this works but he, so when you say that i'm too reactive um what you mean is i'll ask a question and then glenn will kind of ramble and then i'll bite at least some of that before yes, going back yeah. or whatever and then yeah the reason why i do that is and i think i tried it a couple times in this debate is that what i really want to do is after he rambles what i really want to do is like hold on come back to this and address this but if i do that he's talking a lot then i'm going to talk a little bit to recenter and then he's going to ramble again and then i'm going to recenter yeah, and then i feel like the issue the only problem with that ground. is that it gives him the ability to ramble so much i learned that in a I, debate I, a long time ago where i thought I like if i ask it. clarifying questions it's good but i realized if i'm just asking questions it gives them the opportunity to speak so much more than me and i think just, there's a happy medium because i think when i debate i i'm way too much in the cross-examination mode mm -hmm. and I think that you're too much of the getting my point out affirmatively mode. I would, I think that there's a happy medium here, and that if it like if you had hammered a couple more times some of these points, I think it would have been even better than what it was. Uh, like if you had come back every time he would try to be like, well, the Lincoln thing and the Fort Sumter thing, and be like, okay, well, you didn't make it really clear. I just want to, so that the audience is sure. You're a lawyer, right? So you understand these words, insurrections, and, and I'm sure if you have an opinion about insurrection, it's it's informed by uh, uh, you know historical examples. So I'm surprised you don't know anything about Whiskey Rebellion, but just to be a thousand percent clear, Glenn, are you saying the attack on Fort Sumter was an insurrection? Yes or no? I, I think that it is true. You can have your narratives. You can you can say it like that. But like in those moments when there are key, I, I understand. Yeah, I understand that. But he he did answer it. But he'll never answer it straight away. He's going to say like, well, when you say this, but and then he's going to ramble. Like I think it's just when I when I try to get a clear answer on that, and he rambles, I I just I think I lose because okay. he just gets just Listen, so much more. I do I agree with what wrong. you're saying though. I I, I, could, I, could be wrong. It, I think that mm -hmm. you did a really good job no matter what. And so um you know I just think that I can try a couple yeah. moments where I, I I think that just a little bit more insight, a little bit more insisting. Um, doesn't mean you have to go all the way to where I am, but mm -hmm. but just a little bit. But that's it. Is there anything you wish you could have forced an answer on, like any qu particular question? Probably all of them, but I mean like a specific one um, that you would have liked an answer one way or another. Um, it's it's all just like all of this is just like a circle of it's like a circle of galactic bullshit. So I, I, I feel like to do a debate like this, like properly in a way that I would want, I think it would literally have to be like the autistic cross-examination, like we're in court and I'm gonna ask you a very specific question, get an answer and we're gonna build from there. Like, did Donald Trump do this? No, why not? Oh, well, do you consider this as part of that? Or this like very, 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 very clearly through everything, but it would be so autistic and nobody would ever submit themselves to that level of like, an, like Examination, because the problem is that like when you when you try to argue this, there is so much like vague, stupid bullshit that gets gish galloped out over and over again. Like how many times did he talk about the percentage of people that that were violent? Who the fuck cares? What does yeah. that do anything? Mm -hmm. Or how many times did he bring up how many people died? Who cares? It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. How many times did he bring out like you know, well, only the you know one or two people got shot? They didn't even bring out guns. Who cares? You don't need guns. Like yeah, it was only yeah. one hour. It got shorter every time he said it. At first it was three yes. hours, then it was like two two and a half hours. Then it was like like, like it was the time was shrinking. I guess as we yeah. became further away from it. So yeah, I don't know. I. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I just need to do a good job of making sure that people can see that he's like dancing a ton or not answering questions. And which you did, maybe, for sure. I guess, which which I think, you did, yeah. for sure.
Just so silly, yeah. But I'm not sure, yeah. Overall, is this the I end of the J6 real... arc. Um, well, J6 until is until the Supreme gonna... Court. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's going to come back up a lot then. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, man. I, but like, yeah, super, super proud. You could tell he was sweating on a lot of those, and um, and it showed. I think, especially on the history, especially when you ask him to condemn, especially when you brought up the Mike Pence thing, it was just really, really fun to see how inconsistent he was being and how. Uh, you know, he would try to interrupt you when you start with your conclusion or you start with your little characterization. That's another criticism. When you see him go after that a lot of times uh -huh. and when you see him be like, declare victory, declare victory, just like, I understand why you're doing it and I understand that that's your style. I would just get rid of it. After you see that he's able to distract everyone and talk about you declaring victory and all that stuff, I just would excise that. If someone is making a big deal about it, I don't know. I, I, I think that Obviously, it gives him breathing room. It gives him an opportunity to get away from the the merits where you're the most. Strong. Well, I think I I think I usually just like continue whatever I was saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess so. Yeah. You did awesome, bro. bud. I hope yeah. you have yeah. a good rest Great job. Your night. Okay. Well, enjoy your uh, enjoy your night and uh, yeah, good job. I hope you guys have fun. Be careful. Oh, I think I'm talking to Jordan Peterson on the third. That'll be fun. No shit. Whoa. You mean Keffels? No what? Um, oh. <laughs> I don't know that, why, but they the, emailed me. Yeah. Spitting one oh, yeah, shot, true. I guess. That's funny. Yeah. Or, or I don't know, the opposite of what I just said. <laughs> um, Do you know what about? Well, good luck. We what it's about. Steven. Are you what? there? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, I don't, I don't know what it'll be about. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, still okay. trying good to luck. set up dates. Yeah. Have yeah. fun. Be careful. Awesome. See Rip you guys. Love you guys. Peace out.